Good morning, everybody. Welcome to these conferences on democracy, algorithms, and resistance. My name is Judith Membrives Yurens. I'm a technical of digitalization at the FEDE.cat, General Federation of Organizations such as Global Justice, and I also belong to the organizing team of the DAR conference made by Tai Jumpani of the Space Open Society. Good morning, Tai. I don't know if uh, Dai is here with us. I'm sure she will join us. Joseph Ome Ulet of Algorace and Lucia Errandonea. Could you please join us and welcome everybody, please? Hola, buen día. Hello, good morning. Buenos días. Hello, good morning. How are you? Eager to start, delighted to be here. Eager to start, delighted to be here, fantastic. Okay, so let's move ahead. The truth is that it seems impossible that after so many weeks of work, the day has come that we are all welcome here online, virtually, in order to speak, share, and reflect about democracy, algorithms, and resistance. It's been several months since we organized our first meeting to launch this conference. And the first thing we have to decide was, why do we want to organize such a conference? What is the objective? Why are we organizing this? Our organizations have in common, having started a long time ago, a critical reflection towards the process of donation that the society is going through. What are we speaking about? This trend, which is quite generalized to apply algorithms and artificial intelligence systems to carry out tasks and make decisions in different spheres of our daily life. During the next three days, we will discover different examples, but in order to throw some light on what we are thinking, let's take a look at the walls of the media where you don't decide what to watch, but rather an algorithm does according to what they think it's more interesting uh, for you and the profile they have built around you. You can also think about the algorithm deciding which series and movies you are going to see at the video platform that you are going to use or the one used by your mobile phone in order for you to de-block it with your face. These examples are of consumption products which can seem harmless, but we have had several news showing that they are not. We have fake news, we have political penetration by the social media. We have algorithms making racist and transphobic decisions. What happens when the implementation of these artificial intelligence tools and digitation support global policies? What happens when uh, automated decisions decide who decides and who is going to have a subsidy and who doesn't, who can join the bus or no, who can be a probation or no. The power of these technologies in order to condition the lives of millions of people is enough contrasted in order to start debating its social consequences and the use that the public administrations and private companies made of it. Now, the debate, which is just starting, is being led by technological companies and economic forums with an inclination to what we have called techno solutions. That is to say, the idea that technology can solve many of the problems of humankind, which can be summed up as applying technological solutions to social problems. All this deployment and technological deployment is happening without communities and People who are suffering the consequences of these implementations are present in the decision-making processes about its use, development, and deployment. We think, then, that we are facing a context in which it is indispensable to introduce these debates in civil society in order for society to be informed and decide on the implementation of these technologies. Our experience and intuition told us that this is a common worriness. As a sample, the welcome that we have had. Thank you very much. We have more than 300 people registered all over the world, and we have people registered with very 
different profiles, anti-racist movements, feminists, defenders of human rights, people from the academia, people from the administration, from the corporate sector. This diversity of profiles is among the members of our public, and this is the diversity that we wanted to reflect on our program. In order to reach the maximum audience possible, so we have divided our conference in three days. Today, we're going to listen to a brief introduction to all the subjects that are going to be mentioned in the next three days, 100% online, because our objective was to reach all the points of the planet and to create synergies all over the world. Tomorrow, we'll go to the Canodromo, which is a space called Ateneo of Democratic Innovation in Barcelona, and Saturday at the Cultural uh, Space. We also know that not everybody can be uh, three days with us. And this is why we are going to gather in video and text maximum sessions possible, maximum conclusions, maximum of reports in order to create the final portfolio. This was the main reason why we decided to offer some scholarships to people who don't reside in any of these two cities by giving priority to people who belong to social movements with uh, anti-racist or feminist profiles with the idea of approaching groups of all over the Spanish state. Who knows if next year we can make a tour all over Spain. That's an idea I'm, I'm launching. Let's see if my uh, colleagues can reflect it. Nothing of what's going to happen during the next three days. It's by coincidence. Many weeks of preparation. Our values when it comes to deciding these conferences are based on horizontal and horizontality, inclusivity, and diversity. Therefore, we've been especially careful to select voices that approach us, experiences, knowledge, and tell us how to go into action of the different groups. We have representatives of the anti-racist movement of around the world. We have representatives of the feminist movement, representatives of the decolonial movement. And we also have people coming from the academia, but using its research in order to carry out activist practice and grassroots groups uh, in order to generate resistance to power. We have prioritized different spaces to the communities who are not usually present at the forms where technological progress is debated, although they are the ones suffering their consequences. I'm speaking about racialized people, women, non-binary women or people or grassroots activists. Besides sharing knowledge among all these people and from our speakers, I would like to invite you to participate in some sessions during the on-site sessions. We have different workshops and spaces to share. Today, we also wanted to offer you some collaboration space and we have a workshop this afternoon, more than 60 people waiting. Therefore, I ask you that if you have a place, if you have received the email confirming your participation with the instructions of access, and you know that you won't be able to connect, please write us as soon as possible to free this place to the email that my colleagues will write on the mail, societat.oberta at opensociety.org. But I guess that my colleagues will write it in the chat because it's difficult to memorize. Tomorrow in Barcelona, we will start with a couple of roundtables, different initiatives of citizen participation, explaining to us why do we want to include communities affected by artificial intelligence and how to do it. We have had several last minute problems between the pandemia, flights, etc. And for the moment, let me tell you that we will have representatives of democratic society, representatives of the working group and artificial intelligence Barcelona, people from the Adelaide Institute of the United Kingdom, people coming from AI now and people from the Ethical Foundation. The first of the round tables that we're going to celebrate is replacing the talk that we were going to have with Sacha, Sasha Constanza Chok, a member of the Association for the Justice of the US, who uh, on Sunday uh, had COVID and we wish her a quick recovery and wish her to be working with us very soon. Tomorrow afternoon, 
we are going to be hands-on. We have the whole afternoon with participative sessions, three workshops. People who are registered are going to be able to implement many of the knowledge they are learning today and tomorrow morning because it's nice to think, it's nice to reflect and to listen, but it's time to go into action. Therefore, we have three different workshops which will help us to understand how to uh, implement resistance to the implementation of biometrical data gathering. We have another workshop in where we are going to learn about the evaluation of the algorithm impact and another workshop discovering the opportunities given to us by regulation of artificial intelligence at the European Parliament. If you are in Barcelona and you have not joined yet, please register yourself through the web page. You will have to choose one of the workshops. People who will participate in the workshops have prepared them thoroughly and they are going to bring case studies which resonate with us because they've been looking for algorithms and systems of artificial intelligence that are being used nowadays in our country. To close the day, we are going to make a collective reflection to help us to visualize alliances, strategies for the future, and to think how can we generate a little bit of counterpower by social movements. All these that we're going to learn in Barcelona, we will take it to Madrid the following day. The group is going to explain to us what are the different strategies and actions to de-racialize artificial intelligence. And then we will discover how to incorporate each other perspective in the racist fight uh, through Get Up Oman Space, an organization empowering the groups in the margins of the French society through education. In the afternoon, we will have different workshops from appropriation of technology by uh, different groups of racialized, uh, marginalized people. And we will conclude with the reflection, which will complete the one that we initiated the previous day in Barcelona to incorporate all these learnings and try to reach everybody and to deliver a portfolio with the material of our conferences. We have tried to prioritize that you have many spaces in which to share. We know that it's a bit more complicated online. Therefore, let me remind you on the one hand, the official hashtag of the event, hashtag Jornadas Dar, everything with A. And we encourage you to share your reflections, whatever you have like, whatever inspires you, whatever you want in your social media. You are also going to be able to use the streaming chat to share your experiences and ideas. Let me recommend you that first of all, you introduce yourselves with your name, and whether you prefer to use Mr. Miss, Mrs. and also the community or organization you belong to. In the same chat, in different moments, at different moments, you will see a Mentimeter uh, links in order to ask questions to our panelists. We prefer to do the questions through the Mentimeter because it allows us to gather in a more optimal way the different questions and then we think it's more democratic that among all of you, you vote, which are the questions that you want to ask to the speakers or oh, no, the first person reaching the chat, the one that it's been launched or organization deciding which question to ask. Therefore, I ask you to pay attention to the chat in order to be able to participate. As you know, this morning sessions are going to be watched through this YouTube channel. Should you have any technical problem, I hope you won't, you will be contacted via email uh, by using the email I have mentioned before uh, that you have in the chat. Finally, I would like to remind you that today in the online meetings and in the next few days, Barcelona and Madrid, we have a code of conduct. Everybody registered has accepted this code of conduct to guarantee that this is a safe place for everybody. Therefore, no offensive or harassment comments are going to be allowed or any behavior which uh, harasses or includes any verbal offense which is related to gender identity, gender expression, age, sexual orientation, handicap, physical appearance, size, race, ethnical origin, religion, ideology, 
choose of technology, etc. We hope from everybody who is participating, and we expect that they have a specific code of conduct, otherwise to stop immediately, or we will use the rights of admission by expelling them from the chat in the meeting. If at any time you are a victim of this type of situation, please write us an email and we will be hands-on in order to stop this behavior. So we are looking forward to an active and respectful participation, correct and collaborative one. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first session, where, as you know, it's a strong dish. We will listen to uh, Lucia Randonea, who is a specialist in processes of innovation and participation in political sciences, design and participatory uh, management in projects of cities. She has carried out two masters, one new trends, innovation of processes and communication and SPARA communities in management. She coordinates research projects and participatory design in ideas for change. She's also co-founder of the Open Initiative Algorithm and Societies debating and promoting responsibility of artificial intelligence in society and member of the rights community. Lucia is going to tell us what do we understand about democratizing artificial intelligence. What does it mean? She will also explain the whole process which has been followed at the algo rights community to define the meaning of this democratization process. What is the challenges, opportunities, and what are the problems that we face around this concept? I think we're running nine minutes ahead. <laughs> I don't know if my colleagues we want to use uh, these nine minutes to welcome everybody, or should we wait for nine minutes and then we welcome Lucia? Whatever you prefer. Bueno, empiecen que tire, pues Lucia. Okay, so Lucia, please go ahead. You have the floor, and we'll have the break a bit before. Bueno, Go ahead, gracias. Lucia. Great, thank you very much, Judith. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And good morning. I'm very, very happy because after so many months that have gone by, as Judith was saying, I'm a member of Endor Rights, and I'm here representing this organization. And let me tell you that uh, this session makes me especially happy because I'm a politologist, so I hope it's not a pain in the neck. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. First of all, let me make a brief introduction of what Algo Rights is. We are a collaborative network of people from different disciplines and sectors looking to promote the participation of people and organizations of civil society in the field of artificial intelligence technologies with a special approach in human rights. A little bit with this perspective, we have collaborated in the organization of this data conference to discuss, reflect, and learn about different tools helping us, uh, civil society, to make these technologies, on the one hand, understandable and open to have uh, spaces in the decision making process about its design and implementation. So, a total challenge, but there we go. Because, as Judith was saying at the beginning, artificial intelligence, although it seems something of uh, science fiction, is here. It's part of our lives and it's intervening more than one would think. I would like to mention some of the examples and add in examples to what Judith has mentioned at the beginning, for example, of artificial intelligence in the legal sphere. For example, in the evaluation of automatic risk about whether a people is going to commit a crime again. This is an algorithm analyzing different elements of people, giving a degree of risk, helping um, judges to decide whether a person should obtain a permit or not, if they're going to offend again. And this, which has been uh, implemented, for example, in the United States in the compact system with the strong criticisms, because it makes some racial profiles, they give uh, bigger weight of risk to certain groups 
to people from Latin America or women. Also lack of training to the people implementing this because since they did not understand very well how the automatic system works, they trust more this result than their own experience. In Catalonia, there is also a similar system which is called Risk Can Be, which was implemented for more than 10 years, which was more contested by the case. It analyzes every situation. Another example is found in the working environment. Although it is not new, the use of artificial intelligence in this sector, there are more and more specialized algorithms. It is calculated that 16% of employment, human resources, are going to be replaced by this programs before 2029. So there are job interviews where the first filter is done by artificial intelligence technology, the hard view uh, software through a video of the interview, the algorithm evaluates the answers and decides whether to go to the human or no. For example, the question, well, the typical question related to uh, working in teams analyzes whether you have says I instead of we. Um, some situations analyze your reactions and your feelings, but of course, without any reliable scientific base, and of course, without any supervision of the results. So this quick adoption by different parts of society proposes opportunities, but also a real challenge to democracy. So there is this question of where are we nowadays from the point of view of regulation and control of artificial intelligence? There we go, because in the world we have two predominant models. On the one hand, the one of China with a centralized state looking for the total control of its citizens. And on the other one, the one of the USA, the, the far west, where everything is uh, valid, where it has an economic performance. Uh, Spain, uh, Europe, sorry, is looking for a third way, guarantism, trying to place the human being at the heart and worrying by ethics. For example, in this sense, we should highlight the joint declaration made by national and international organizations requesting the prohibition of systems of prediction and profiles within the law of artificial intelligence law, which probably you will have there on the chat if you want to take a look at it. So European countries from its stance and also from nations and governments make an effort to create this new constitution and mechanism looking after the citizens of uh, the rights of its citizens in the field of artificial intelligence, the right to control and make transparent what those technologies are deciding in an automatic way in different fields, public and private. In the end, these processes helping us to democratize, which is the big word, and we're going to explain what it means to democratize artificial intelligence. Some of these efforts can be found in the involvement of the citizens in citizens' assemblies for the design of the artificial strategy of Scotland, which was published not long ago. I think that it was last year under the motto artificial intelligence, reliable, inclusive ethics, including the citizens in these processes of design of the strategy from a government point of view. We can also highlight that in the Spanish state, it is relevant, the announcement made not long ago of the creation of the National Agency of Supervision of Artificial Intelligence. Although it's been define still, we hope it will approach the evaluation of artificial intelligence according to human rights, as our group is trying to promote, and also to be open to the citizens. And in the hand of this context, we are thinking about the challenges which represent the democratization of artificial intelligence, accountability, governance in our public institutions and the consequences for our communities. Therefore, uh, 
uh, we have been reflecting quite a lot about what it means to democratize, because sometimes it is a concept which is quite ambiguous, overused, abused, or that you cannot understand very well what it's all about. And so far, we're thinking about these things. On the one hand, the need to establish a public debate in democracies and its role in society to promote different narratives, that is to say, uh, as you know, uh, narratives create realities and to promote different narratives, balancing or contrasting what is hegemonic, something which is mainstream nowadays. And they are going to incorporate different perspectives or messages which are diverse and plural. On the other hand, to make awareness of the use of artificial intelligence in the different fields in an accessible and easy way. Knowing the technology, as we were saying, is not neutral. That is to say, it responds to certain interests to have a society informed from a global perspective. And it's necessary to guarantee human rights, to know what type of algorithm can be implemented, how to do it, and how much does it cost, is part of looking after the transparency of policies and institutions. On the other hand, participation of the citizens in the development of artificial intelligence. As you mentioned before, uh, maybe a while ago, the Scottish example, these national assemblies where people can have an impact on the design of this strategy. I think that there is kind of a demand from all collectivities to contribute in a constructive manner to design the AI system. We need to create inclusion mechanisms from the civil society perspective in order to have a much more robust uh, process, but also to repair the damages that were caused by automatized decisions and to have a more balanced algorithmic justice. Also to boost AI with uh, democratical aims and goals. To democratize, it is to use AI for the common good, as we saw at the beginning, the principle of Eugeni Morozov. We believe that all world problems can be solved so through technology. We can also apply the four freedoms of software when it is possible to use, to distribute, and to improve in such a, an open manner. It is also to rethink what are the economic models behind the curtains. The access to AI, it doesn't mean to have a cheaper cost, but also to review ethical, social, and political issues. It is also to promote collectivities and the social movements to share the knowledge and to offer some answers. So we reach to a point that we are aware that we must review many questions and issues such as, are our governments ready to open this uh, AI democratization and to have a much more adapted regulation? How can we face all the influence and needs in public policies? We don't have an answer right now. I'm deeply sorry. This is kind of a spoiler. We don't have an answer. But it is clear, at least, what would be the future. We don't know what would be the future, but we know that the way ahead, it is to promote building together spaces where all voices there will play their own role. After this uh, food for thought, we'd like to invite you all to comment on what do you think about democratization of the artificial intelligence. Thus, we will have kind of a very short compilation of your opinions through the Metameter, which is a platform that uh, will allow us to answer and to know and to quickly respond to your ideas. We will compile all along these three days your uh, ideas 
in order to better know what's the uh, different positions and the scope that you have. When we will uh, publish this in algorithms, I don't know, we had very, uh, contra lots of contradictions, different opinions. So at the end of the day, we want to compile and together all the opinions to have a much more tuned opinion in order to know what do you believe about AI democratization. Therefore, I'm going to share right now my screen. I think that you already have in your chat the link to have access through a code that we facilitated to you. Well, I'm going to send it right now. I'm going to share with you. Okay. Now, uh, we'll see what are you writing now. Can you see it? Okay, cool. All right. The first idea that I have in mind, AI, uh, when we talk about democratization and of a very abstract thing, this is something that we witness, right? Yeah, sometimes we have to fill in. We have to fill in there are kind of formulas or concepts or ideas that are overused or maybe the academia uses a lot this idea and we do not understand what do they really mean. I'm having kind of issues. All right, uh, is it working and loading now? All right, that's it. No, it never happens to me. Okay. Okay, never happened. And well, we will keep on compiling and gathering all your opinions, as uh, I mentioned before, in these uh, three uh, seminar days. The final idea is to have a common point of view. What a level of no technical knowledge we should have to democratize and to open technologies. Okay, yes, now it's getting fun. Uh, when we have uh, difficulties to democratize societies, we must ask the difficulty to democratize something which is uh, technically complex, such as understanding of AI. Yes, you're right. This is uh, the issue, the most important problem. We must create things understandable. What do we mean by AI? Democratize is a way to have an impact in accumulating processes of power from the big tech uh, corporations and to broaden who is going to be the main character, what do we want uh, to produce and to whom we want to produce AI. I can see for a while that we talk about it and it seems very worrisome. And it's not an abstract thing. We can witness very specific examples of it. Yes, you're right. We can see that there are more organized communities that help us to better understand this issue. We have control groups. We will see all along the seminar. You can see that there are some kind of uh, algorithmic evaluations and assessments. How can we explain AI? to uh, children, what does this mean? And what are the implications? Yes, I think that today, uh, right now kids, yeah, they will have, let's say, they will have a higher level of influence because at the end of the day, they will be growing in such a different world, right? They will be more influenced by the AI and let me tell you that this is uh, something that has to do with the algorithms. And we say, if my mother doesn't understand, we cannot understand. So we want to spread the message that uh, it has to fit for everybody, this kind of algorithms. Also, what are the uh, democratization models that we have to be democratized? It's to make things understandable not only for experts. Well, we have loads of comments here, guys. All right. So I don't know if uh, we can carry on or should we stop here or anyway, 
there are loads of things in common that are food for thought. And I think that these three days we'll be able to review the existing elements and to broaden our spaces and to think about it. I know that there are loads of uh, discussion spaces and meetings. Therefore, we will talk a lot about all these issues. So with any further to say, I'd like to ask the organizers, what should we do right now? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. We can hear you. We can see you. Hello, Monse. Well, things are going very fast because now this should have taken till 10.30. But let's see. What can we propose? We can start at 10.35 and we will have a break, but I'd like the others to say yes or no. And I'd like to add something. I'd like to invite you to sharing your opinion about what's democratizing, what do you understand by AI democratization? Please. Give your opinion because this will help us to bring this discussion tomorrow in Barcelona and after tomorrow in Madrid. And maybe we will offer you some uh, information through a post or maybe a brochure. We will see. We will be working with this in these next two days. I need a confirmation from the organizers. So, what do you think? Should we have a break? or till 10.35 for the next panel. We will count with Simola Levy with Exnet uh, from, with Alberto Alvaro from the Observatory of Algorithm and Society and Giuseppe Emulet from Digital Borders. And uh, the moderator is going to be Monse Santolino from Feather.cat because the previous moderator, Carmen Juarez, uh, well, uh, has got COVID and we wish her a very quickly recovery and we send her a big hug. See you later, 10.35. Thank you.
Bueno, pues ya volvemos a estar okay, aquí. Okay, so here, here, we're here once again. I hope that you have been Ahora vamos able con... to have a coffee and breakfast. We're going to present a round table now where we're going to listen to three super important speakers. We're very happy to welcome them. The round table is how civil society hack es decir, nos van a explicar the, cómo the, utilizamos las propias herramientas tecnológicas para this of the system to hack so to go against these inequalities generated by the system and for this our mother y comunicador will be Monse Santolino, who is coordinator of Fede.cat, specializing in narratives on inequalities and human rights. As I have said before, Monse is replacing Carmen Suarez, whom we wish a quick recovery. So, Monse Santolino, you have the floor whenever you want. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, all of you for being here after this uh, short coffee break that we have all enjoyed. As you did well, the same. I belong to an NGO a group in 125 organizations and uh, I'm presenting Obviamente, uh, three de... organizing entities and I'm very happy that uh, we have participated in these conferences. We are very happy and also to be with uh, three speakers I'm so happy to be sharing with. As Judith has said, something that she has commented before and something that we have been listening to before as a federation and also as representative of uh, representative of human Derechos son rights. Sociales, we know perfectly well that uh, human rights are not present, are not concessions, but rather uh, fighting field they've been um, for a long time. And democratizing societies depends on citizens and organizations and collectives to fight for these rights. This is the way it has always been from the very beginning, from the very basic political and social rights to the new economic, uh, social and cultural rights, which are still part of the battleground. And now of absolute digitation and digitation is starting to be implemented everywhere in our society. As organizations of human rights, we realize that the field of automation and also artificial intelligence, it's a new battleground and it's a new space for the conquer of rights. There is an old saying in Latin America that says that the right which is not defended, it's a right that we uh, lose. And Latin American feminists know it very well, but the space and digitation of artificial intelligence is a space where we can go deep into different inequalities, something that you we are already seeing, but it's also space to achieve, to guarantee, or to provide new rights. This is a space, a working space, which is very interesting and very necessary. In this sense, what happens is that we realize that as public administrations, and especially public companies, private companies, sorry, in the recent years, they have made a giant uh, leap forward in the development of different applications and implementation of different systems of artificial intelligence and automation from the social sector, social organizations and uh, citizens groups. We see that this is something that is going to be difficult to go deep into. There's a lot of respect, sometimes even fear to what is technical to this idea of what we consider technical. On the one hand, we are a sector, the sector of associations with the digital culture which is precarious, although that uh, this is something that we uh, had to get used during the pandemic, but still, still, we don't have entities with a very developed digital culture. On the other hand, we have mystified the narration. The narration that has been made on artificial intelligence is something super far away and super complicated. So, this is a space where it's becoming difficult to go deep. Fortunately, we have more and more experiences, but this is a difficult 
sphere for social organizations. And in a way, with today's conference, this is what we want. We want to help activists, citizens who fight for human rights, social organizations. We want to tell them not to be fearful of artificial intelligence, of automation. Uh, first, because obviously this is uh, space of uh, work that we have to belong to, and also because the only ones that can identify and report violation of human rights, even if we don't know exactly how to do it or how it is happening, the ones that uh, know that these human rights are being violated is ourselves, organizations, groups. And in this sense, we have to be present, although technically our technical expertise, uh, we're not there yet. And we have not developed quite well our technical expertise. All of them, technology, artificial intelligence, are great tools which will allow us to face the different challenges that we have ahead of us from a global perspective, but we are the only ones who can report on this deepening of inequalities, not only to report them, but go into the field of proposals, meaning proposing investments, and promoting technological models, democratic models, and to move forward so these new tools and these new technologies are really at the disposal of the common good. In this sense, this roundtable is approaching how to present some of the experiences that we are already implementing because we are moving forward and we already have experiences and initiatives of a specific steps taken by organizations and groups that have uh, started to work and to identify different uh, violations of uh, human rights, specific rights, as you will see in this table, and they have been placed on the table and they have started working and examining how to do it. And we are going to listen to the different experiences and we will see whether from a very huge technical expertise or from a condition of a huge space where to work. So without further ado, without any further introduction, I would like to give the floor to our guest. As uh, Judith was saying, we have here with us Alberto Álvarez, uh, Tito Álvarez for us here in Catalonia. Uh, we also have Josef Ulet and Simona, who are going to explain to us how have they started, how to start. And we guess they represent three successful working experiences, three ways in which we have already started working in the defense of these different rights. How to defend these rights? We're going to start by listening to Tito Alvarez. Let me introduce Tito, who is the coordinator of the Professional Association of the Taxi of Barcelona. So he's a taxi driver to begin, but he's also promoter of the observatory work algorithms and society. As Judith has already mentioned, Carmen Juarez, who had to moderate this round table, but she cannot be with us because of COVID. She's someone who has been working on many aspects related to how to introduce a platform on the working space. So uh, labor, employment rights is one of the clear cases where these algorithms are having very clear effects on the labor rights of workers, consequences which are very material and very specific. And this is why we wanted to invite Tito so he could explain how his, from his sector and his experience, how they are accepting this automation of the employment conditions and their fight because the observatory is working on collectives and society and why this observatory, what do they want within the framework of the riders legislation? We don't know uh, how to move forward 
and we don't know how to believe. Tito, please tell us how have you reached this observatory, the objective, what moment you are at. Okay, so greetings everyone. My name is Tito. And we started in the taxi association. We are a very combative association. We have organized uh, several meetings and we realized that we had to widen our scope and to become more professional and to explore the different fields, not only stopping uh, the cities and going on to strike. So we surround ourselves by professionals, researchers, computer experts, and we started to speak with the writers by rights because we think that we have identical problems, we share identical problems, and we realize that Uber and these platforms are the same ones that are behind different sectors. I'm going to skip all the part related to the taxi because I don't have much time. And in the end, the task, which is the Observatory of Work, Algorithm and Society, it's a fusion between Raides por Derecho, with the taxi and taxi project. We're crazy as to believe that all this can be fought against. And we have carried out some studies quite powerful studies. Let me tell you about one of them, which is that from the project association, taxi project, which is an association of taxi drivers from a state perspective, and we provide a totally different approach to the representative associations of the taxi and the territory where we work. We hire a hacker and we have created an algorithm which is supervising the price algorithms, especially prices, for example, in Madrid community and also Costa del Sol. And we have seen that Cabify call an Uber algorithms. There is, there are many indicators that point to the fact that among them are vigilant. So when Uber increases its prices, Bolt and Cabify see that the algorithm realizes that they're activating this dynamic fee. So they also increase the prices. And there is a correlation of more than 70% in many cases and in many of the trips. We have also seen that in some routes, depending on the neighborhood and the purchasing power, the algorithm reacts in a way or in another. Uh, so this is a world that when we start going deep into, we realize on how complicated it can be also for the administrations to control all this, because we have presented at some agency dedicated to fair competition, we have mentioned this, and those agencies, and we have also presented this, and this is the second part that I want to explain at the trade union, they are recognizing they have no capacity to regulate all this. And this is quite worrisome because in the end, the black box of the algorithm that nobody can see, where we throw everything, all the guilt when a rider uh, has an accident and it's disconnected when a rider receives worse services due to a series of parameters that cannot be proven. When a consumer receives an abusive charge and everything is uh, thrown onto the algorithm, we have a problem. And we have a huge problem. And the same administrations don't know how to control. And this is something that we have seen in other countries, such as France, the United Kingdom. We have an international network, which is quite powerful. And we share many data, similar data. And we are seeing that in the end, well, they're all stepping on our employment rights, rights of the consumers. We have also analyzed everything related to drivers. We have taken Cabify drivers and we have seen the punctuation given by the driver 
we have done it with a computer, which means that uh, from the company, hypothetically, they can lower the punctuation given by the client. So you're obliged to be online for more hours. And all this has a direct influence on your working conditions. And this rating, well, you can rate because of race, gender, or if someone was upset and you provide an excellent service, you say, okay, today I'm going to fuck him up and I'm going to rate him as a zero or one. And all this has a direct consequence on the working conditions, on your salary and everything, which we think is outside any logic and outlaw also. We have reported to the competent authorities, inspection at work, and the truth is that the uh, algorithms is not going very well. We think uh, have a problem from an organization point of view, financing when it comes to uh, gather resources and to widen all this, which is very important to do it. And we are in this field about rider. Uh, there are some things that are nice. For example, uh, labor, there is more than 50 sentences. And there is uh, a labor relation. I, I don't know how a law has been passed. And there are so many sentences, and this is one. Uh, but there is also control, or the trade unions can ask um, for the control of the algorithm or transparency of the algorithm, so how they work, how they organize. Uh, this, but the trade unions do not have this capacity. In the end, you don't need a lawyer. You organize all this. So this is the world that we are living, digital fascism, because in the end, it's trying to impose yourself, cheating yourself, stealing from you, and committing a technological crime, whatever you want to call it. And well, from the observatory, we believe that it's very important that a couple of groups that we would like to widen, and our objective is to widen it with time and to make them more international. It is very important that uh, all this reaches Europe. And the most important thing, because in the end, whether we like it or not, from the European Commission and the European Parliament, where all these directives are going to be published, such as the different platform workers that we're working on, and where if you pay attention to the power of these economic lobbies that had to be closed by the end of the month of June, and they could widen it until November, this directive, where it has been discussed how much of the this is the presentation of vulnerability uh, can be uh, from one to five. We're not many, I know. So we lost the speaker, he's frozen. Many of the organizations working on this. And I think that we are very strong, but we always try to create networks in order to share information and maybe to fight against all these. It's very incredible because we have analyzed more than 3 million petitions of services with this algorithm that I explained at the beginning, and we have seen some outrageous uh, things such as, for example, what this public administration uh, has been doing with it. Besides that there should be an agency having the capacity of uh, controlling this, we have always thought that when a company working with these systems wants to operate in a specific country, the first thing that we have to do is to pass these filters 
and uh, not stepping on consumer rights and maybe paying for taxes where you are operating all the things that are so important and obvious and now you open an app introduce an algorithm and then you find the the different results either they find you they sanction you but it's very cheap and this is what i think that we should be working on and keep fighting and adding on our on the other on one hand we are working on this but we still need many resources the administration is very slow technology this type of technology is going very fast uh, and we are always like uh, on the defensive stepping behind our intention is to go ahead and to be part of the because we are part of a lobby now uh, where all the taxi drivers belong and maybe also um, sometimes the taxi does not have a presence in Europe and then there was an international federation also where everybody from Portugal and Italy have already reached an agreement with uh, Uber and well yes it's a very complicated uh, situation as you can imagine but especially here in Barcelona what we are building is to be able to be part of these spaces arguing with the report all this type of economy has imagine then in the us there is a study of more than 50 cities where it has been proven with numbers and objective uh, data that uber is not uh, fulfilling this right and this is happening within the european union Vamos al ritmo que vamos y hacemos lo que podemos. Y, pero bueno, es aprovechar al máximo y exprimir al máximo los recursos que tenemos. Perfecto. Tito, muy bien, perfecto. Muchas gracias. Después, después eh, seguimos. Creo que has apuntado algunas cosas eh, fundamentales. La, la falta de recursos, la necesidad de, de juntarnos, ¿no? Diferentes actores, porque es una lucha donde al otro lado hay... You mentioned several things. On the one hand, there are lots of funds and money and uh, we need to develop a little bit more of muscle, right? And uh, we do have this uh, concept in mind. Thank you. We'll see later on together with you, Tito. We are talking about labor rights and now we're going to talk about another field, fighting against uh, racism. We'd like to listen to Josep Poulet. Uh, he's a journalist and he's the responsible for non-discrimination department at the Rights International Spain organization. And I don't know if it's kind of an organization, but I think that he is uh, like making some racing uh, profiles. And Giuseppe is always the coordinator of Argo Race, which is a group of uh, people trying to introduce this anti-racism perspective in all the public uh, debates. We invited Joseph because uh, we are aware that we are implementing things that are quite uh, working very well. And we'd like to talk with him about the manifestos, which are at the forefront of the uh, political uh, fight. And this uh, manifesto of uh, the use of AI in uh, southern countries. This had quite a big impact on the press. And uh, in the end, they uh, presented a new uh, legal proposal. So Joseph would like you to tell us in a very uh, concise manner, what are the problems of these uh, smart borders? And uh, to what extent this initiative has been implemented and what did you do with this uh, manifesto? Welcome, Joseph. you have the floor. Good morning. I'd like to thank you all and congratulate you all. Thank you to all the members of the team. I'd like to greet my uh, dear colleagues. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, getting into the point, 
at the end of last year, 2021, December, through several informations that we got through press and media, right? Uh, the media said that the Spanish government wanted to put into practice kind of a tricky aspect that was the so-called smart borders in the borders of the uh, cities of Ceuta in and Melilla to use AI gathering mainly uh, biodata as uh, we witness uh, facial data, fingerprints, you know, those data that belong to individuals. And facing this new trend, some organizations, and uh, we are one of the organizations, the ones that we created this seminar, we created digital borders because we wanted to point the dangers while implementing AI and what will entail when violating human rights, non-respecting the uh, freedom of movement, the right to know, being identified, the right to privacy, and not complying with the uh, proportionality principles that uh, were uh, already, that came into force after the Dublin agreements. So this uh, bigger automatization of uh, border controls, uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of a strengthening racial and colonial uh, European uh, uh, Union perspectives. That's why we launched the uh, manifesto you were talking about, the so-called implementing AI in the borders and uh, rights violation. It was signed by more than 80 organizations. And we underscore something that it's a uh, fundamental when we want to see how are we allocating money uh, from uh, the European Union, it doesn't go through basic needs. Uh, we can see that there is a huge proportion devoted to this kind of uh, projects. And this uh, border model comes from the European Union. It was approved in 2017. It was uh, called the entry and exit system. Already in 2019, it was announced that there will be a public contract of uh, 249 million euros to develop this uh, digital infrastructure in this new uh, border model. The budget now has reached 212 million, and in 2020, the member states, they already signed a contract over coming 300 million euros to design and to implement these uh, biocontrol strategies and to control the uh, migration and uh, people movements. Well, it was already mentioned in the previous panel, right? And someone said that at the European level, since last year, the European Commission already launched this uh, legislative proposal to regulate AI all over the continent, all over the Union. And uh, this uh, classifies the use of uh, AI in uh, migration controls in a high risk uh, classification, but they never face how these systems, they increase inequalities, discrimination uh, against uh, migrant people. Beyond that, the uh, legal proposal doesn't avoid the most uh, complicated and tricky elements when uh, dealing with uh, migrant control. And the proposal doesn't include for those systems that already are integrated in all uh, data gathering from the European Union, because we talk about data gathering that it's already existing, this so-called Eurodat system, which is a system that gathers biodata such as the fingerprints, right? And well, uh, it is uh, mainly used to uh, control uh, people's uh, flow and to uh, make easier all the deportations uh, from those people that are asylum seekers and are not allowed to get into countries. And also those that were accepted as asylum seekers, they have to live uh, usually in Southern European countries. So usually the first countries they reach through the Dublin Convention that doesn't allow them to move all around the European territories. Well, several weeks after 
the uh, publication of uh, the manifesto. So after some weeks, uh, after the uh, news that we got uh, about the model that would needed to be implemented in Ceuta and Melilla, a few weeks ago, several organizations at a national as well as international level, we had a declaration together by Adrian Vitria to ask to the European Union to ban all these predictive systems of AI and all these solutions that were applied against the vulnerable populations, such as migrant people trying to cross this border uh, and uh, that sometimes they see forbidden the movement, right? So we were asking to not to allow this kind of practices because the entry and access system in itself, we can see that it's a written down. It says that it doesn't respect the regulation. Therefore, it's at the margins of the uh, rights that are protected uh, through the uh, citizenship law. There is kind of a hierarchy when protecting the individual's rights from digital borders and many other organizations at international level. We are asking for the uh, derogation of this uh, ruling that recognizes facial recognition because it really creates loads of dangers because this uh, new AI law that is trying to be passed, instead of forbidding the uh, negative effects on uh, migrant people, instead of getting rid of the negative effects, we are criminalizing more and more migrant people. At the end of the day, the narrative of this border model has to do with the relationship that the borders have with terrorism, crime trying to offer this kind of narrative that criminalizes migrants. This is a message usually coming from the far right uh, parties and we can witness how they try to legitimate these uh, migrant uh, policies. As uh, Sarah Sander mentioned a few days ago from Edri, these systems of AI applied at the border, they are strengthening this uh, migrant and racial control. As a consequence of uh, this uh, manifesto and as a consequence of the incidents that we made and uh, being aware about where does the money come from, uh, what are they trying to make in Ceuta and Melilla, where does the money come from, money from the European countries that we are all offering, and also the incidents work from a political perspective. I think that on the 24th of March, at the Spanish Congress was approved a non-binding proposal about the use of facial recognition technologies and many other bio recognition systems at the border points. It was uh, proposed by Nidas Podemos and Comú Podem and Galician Comón. These political parties were asking to the government to guarantee some technical standards to regulate hardware and software used by AI in order to identify uh, facial recognition and data processing for not to increase discrimination under the criteria that we want to protect, race, nationality, but also gender. And we are asking through this uh, non-binding proposal, it was uh, boosted by the civil society, we are asking to apply some guarantees to know uh, where are allocated the funds. So this lack of knowledge of the algorithms we don't know how do they work. We need to know the recipe and how do they work. And then some technologies, they uh, won't have to create any kind of dangers for political and individual freedoms. Having said this, this is kind of a progress that we, are, that we have made. Some measures are implemented top down through the defense of uh, all of us, but it's not sufficient at all. 
It's very valuable. However, we need to make some efforts. It is also valuable, the announcement of the creation of the uh, algorithm uh, supervision agency. It's kind of a positive thing to have this kind of agency. And Tito mentioned before, it is compulsory to have this agency to control how labor rights have been vulnerated. And also we need to have a better regulation and to know in a permanent manner through audits, through researches, through advertising all the audit results for us to know how right at the border points have been vulnerated and how we are criminalizing people from a race perspective. Yes, I'd like to ask you later about it, about the incidents, the real incidents and the impact of, of these uh, new strategies. Thank you very much, Joseph. Because you were crystal clear, it was quite a flagrant case, such a crucial case where the application of AI is increasing the level of discrimination, strengthening and worsening this uh, European uh, policies against uh, migrants. It's great to see that cab drivers and anti-racist people, you are at the front line lobbying in Europe and listening to the European citizenship. This really means that we have an availability of being ready and to have a great incident in the field. Now I'd like to give the floor to Simona Levy. Simona Levy, needless to say, we don't need to introduce her, but let me just remind that she is a, a drama a director, but also she's a strategist. This is what we really want to know about her. She's an activist, a teacher, she works in many fields, and lately her work has been devoted to renew democracy, obviously today, but from the uh, free culture and the strategic use of digital tools to broaden democratic action and to fight against corruption. Simona also works in the field of uh, activism, but also in the field of offering proposals. Simona is uh, fighting against Google at school level, and they are looking for new alternatives. They are building new alternatives uh, against Google because they want to test and prove together with Xnet. She's been leading a pilot plan for uh, some schools to have their open source software and to democratize uh, digital tools. And this work has been uh, possible in alliance with um, municipal bodies and organizations and apparent associations, this was needed. And we invite her to let us know about this democratization plan in schools. How did we reach this new strategy? And here you are, Simona, welcome. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Here I am. Loads of a fighter. It is so cool to see that we are facing all the problems and issues. I founded Xnet together with my buddies in 20, 2008. It is an association uh, that uh, fights for digital rights and how we can, in this digital era, how we can improve democracy. Thus, we build strategies and some citizen devices and bodies. We are a very small group and we created network, new networks with many other people aiming at reaching very specific goals. We have some device, devices to include uh, bankers. We created uh, quite a freaky political party without uh, people. Yeah, it was a party against parties. It was the RX party that thought about reconstructing the structure of uh, parties because the buffer for a better democracy, it is the bad structure inside the political parties. We need a new structure, XNet. It is uh, quite a new device fighting for digital rights and many other activities. But today we were asked to offer you a much more complete uh, success case 
And uh, this case has to do with uh, democratic uh, education digitalization. Inside of a broader framework that it's uh, called the proposal for a sovereign digitalization in Europe, we're working at the European level, as my previous colleagues mentioned. These uh, battles have to be made from many sides through these lobbying activities. We will be able to transform regulation. Sometimes we need to act at a local level. Sometimes we need to be more proactive at a European level. So we are trying to fill this gap and to make possible this new digitalization because the evidence says that societies, uh, today we talk a lot about the 5G, the algorithm, et cetera, and so on and so forth. For sure, we need to talk about it, but we are not telling that the fundamentals of uh, digitalization are in a very, very bad shape. In this digital era, we can work and communicate peer to peer. We could not violate the right to non availability of communications using all together Gmail. We all have a Gmail, right? It is kind of an absurdity to allow societies to get digitalized through uh, center uh, email structures when the right of communications, we have it seen the 18th century. So we are going three centuries backwards. So we need to improve this interpersonal communication model. Inside this broader framework, we have a three prototypes. We are dealing with emails and internet uh, surfing and also digitalization in public services. These are the three pillars. And we try to fill the gap between Europe and Barcelona. Okay, 2019, Exnet gets closer to a group of parents. And parents in schools, they tell us that they didn't know a uh, lot about education. They were not aware about what they could do uh, at the level of uh, communication in the educational field. But you know, the Federation of uh, Parents Associations, which is, uh, they fight a lot. They are very fearful. And this federation told us that uh, sons and daughters, they had to sign the authorization for digital scholarizations through Big Tech um, through Google and Microsoft uh, all over Europe. I do work in Europe and I know the European situation. Therefore, we only have Microsoft or Google Big Techs and they provide everything. The emails, the document management, everything that creates the education system, the family members, the teachers, they get into a cloud that do not belong to schools and individuals. And you don't know what will happen with your data and content. They know 100% about what they could do. And this is not a serenity. And it is obvious, and this is not something new, right? We realized that the education sector that is suffering a lot of strikes and teachers, they suffer very bad working conditions, mainly after the pandemic, with lots of responsibility. They are working very hard, our teachers, but there is no choice. If I'm a teacher, uh, an art history teacher, and I want to use digital tools, so well, there are no choices, no alternatives. Open source software always existed in the education system. And uh, we have before the property uh, software, we have the open source uh, uh, software, but there were no people working in the open source systems in the educational field, but model already existed before. Sorry, because I had to move my mic. Well, once the institutions uh, uh, have well, I'm a from a very big tech. I'm offering you this uh, digitalization process for free, and everything will be very well structured and will work very smoothly. What does this free mean, right? So, what kind of school could think that a private corporation working mainly to advertise things, 
that digitalize a million of people, a million of boys and girls in the public school system in Catalonia, and they do it for free? How can we imagine that they do not get any kind of benefit? Well, this is kind of a tricky thing because there are no competitors. Suddenly, our institutions are making product placement of a private company. They are making digitalization, which is not a democratic one because we cannot audit and it's not sovereign. Everything that is created by the education community and it's inside this platform, it's a closed uh, product. They are making product placement from a very brutal and radical manner. Therefore, we consider that we are uh, lacking behind and the education institutions, they have no margin to work with. And one of the reasons that justifies that there is no an open source software able to compete with user friendliness, they can compete very well to when dealing with features because the Moodle has more possibilities than uh, Classical, right? But when we talk about use friendliness, agility, and logging as just once, the low investment of the public sector in order to create, this is what our colleagues said before, in order to create everything that our colleagues said before. We are a civil society that is creating the tools that institutions should create from the algorithm analysis uh, that was mentioned by Tito. It's not only people from the NGOs that will uh, assess the algorithmic abuses, but we have to do it. Otherwise, the public institutions won't do it. The border uh, uh, controls the impacts that this will have and how to reduce the impact. So there is kind of a laziness uh, and trying to be a kind of a politically correct. There is kind of a laziness from the institutions for not to control that digitalization to be created from the perspective of a human rights, solidarity and democracy. And how to invest in an open source code that will be able to be interoperable and to recognize the rights of uh, public investments in digital world because we are living this era and we'll live in the future. And this will have an impact on a local companies, cooperatives because open source can be uh, worked and developed by everybody. We don't need these huge monsters, these big techs for them to maintain the code and to keep up with the code and to have a high quality code. Why do we use everybody Gmail? Let me be clear, because we, it was made a huge dumping to offer for free Gmail, right? And it's almost impossible to have a email server service profitable. So no one is creating uh, their email accounts. So we don't have our own software. And this should be a public responsibility. The availability of uh, emails, uh, services, these are public services. And once again, we talk about the same, right? The same rights that we conquered three centuries ago. Facing this new situation, what did we do? What is lacking? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Hackers usually say, and we learn a lot from hacker culture, and we apply it straightforward in our technical political strategies. Hackers, they say that a problem should not be solved twice. Everything is invented to digitalize society. And in this specific case, to improve education, we created this democratic digitalization plan with three main legs. The first two legs are the same. We will use a cloud system. We know that a cloud is not a cloud in the sky. It is a computer that belongs to another individual. In this specific case, we are talking about big international corporations. So 
we will be able to use the clouds. We will be able to get in the cloud. Schools and individuals will get in the cloud to see if the uh, historic re psychological report not to be there. We don't want to know after several years that uh, we were bulimic and you cannot get a job because you were bulimic in the past. And there are some files that say that you were bulimic in the past. We need sovereign servers. This is lacking a lot and we need that. It is important to have a public investment to boost this kind of investment all over the world. We must put together open source uh, code consolidated such as WordPress, Netmood, Etherpad, all these open source codes that are already consolidated. However, in this specific project, and thanks to the companies that got this uh, Barcelona municipality call, and they are public procurement companies, we were able to create this uh, single structure and a single uh, individual will need to use its a private email account. We can do it with a user and a password, and all the uh, pieces are interconnected. Why am I talking about the municipality of Barcelona? Because in 2019, and we proposed that to the Catalan government too, because the competencies at the Spanish level, they belong to the different autonomous communities, but our we don't uh, have to ask a bigger effort for a software to be open source. Institutions must pay for this code. And this is a vindication, an absolute vindication. There is no other choice. This is an obligation. Public services cannot be digitalized through a non-public open source code and any kind of investment made by an institution should be open source code to create jobs, to create possibilities, to be possible to make some audits. If I can see something here, I can bring it to another place if I don't like the service. Well, the Catalan government is trying to assess this kind of narrative. They are helping us uh, from uh, this new government. The previous government didn't want to collaborate with us, but the municipality of Barcelona, the Democratic Innovation Department, looked for the project, came to see us, to seek the project, and in Barcelona, they wanted to create this pilot project. They started in three schools, in three different centers. We are not working this week with more than 10 schools, there is a demand for more than 500 uh, schools. Uh, we cannot uh, satisfy this demand in Catalonia due to the previous reasons that I gave you from the Catalan government. So we are only working in a pilot manner in Barcelona City Council and the uh, Barcelona City Council, right? And I don't get the money for that. It's uh, the uh, procurement, public procurement company said it doesn't cost anything. So. We need half million for that. Uh, the municipality doesn't have this amount of money. They are offering a lower amount. Therefore, the code, which is the solution to all public services from all over Europe, right? Which is how to incorporate and how to optimize in an open source manner. We call it uh, in order to repeat the fascist language, because we like it a lot, otherwise there are some things behind. We are calling it the, we are reconquering the digital independence in Europe. This is kind of a very fragile thing, but this is the starting point of something obvious. Code has to be public for everybody. And let me just conclude just telling something. As for digital fascism, I do agree. I work with a digital issue since uh, 2006. You were a reference uh, to other many other things. We were a reference uh, for digital things. And I cannot congratulate the left-wing parties because I think that left-wing parties, they have always had kind of a tricky discourse, as Monster said at the beginning, not all the left-wing parties, but loads of the lefty 
parties, they have, uh, well, they are the guilty ones because many left the parties said that the internet was very dangerous and part of the censorship that we are living now, the right parties, they wanna use digital services to control as we said before. But civil society not to have access to the internet because it is dangerous. Why do we have to put some walls and how to control it? This kind of speech and narrative has been 100% encouraged by left uh, uh, wing parties that are still at power. Therefore, the left wing parties has to be aware about it in a very powerful manner to speed up the process, to get the time that they lost. Sometimes, well, if they were aware about the civil society, we are there for many years. These kind of left wing parties didn't want to listen to us. That's why we have this digital fascism and the left wing parties that are very compromised and are in favor of internet censorship. Thank you, Simona. I like this how reconquering right in Europe. It is clear, as we said before. Of course, inversion and public investments, uh, there we are as a process of this right, and the administrations are still responsible for this, especially the left. Okay, we are running a bit behind, but not too late, but let me ask a question to the three of you, and we will start by gathering the different answers of the chat. I think that you have already the code in order for you to ask the question, but the first question would be, as we said before, one of the objectives that we have stated in this conference is to start generating different movements in order to claim and to demand a national agency of supervision of algorithms, open, transparent, binding with real participation of the civil society. So the first question to the three of you, very quickly, would be that one. So what are the different characteristics? What would you request from this national agency? And what are the things that we have to place on the list of demands? If they open our account and they say, what do you need? So from your point of view, how this should be or how this agency should work from difficulty, from investment, from these different functions that we have had so far, what would you request to this agency? So more or less, we're going to have a couple of minutes. Tito, Josef, Simona, what can we request from this agency? Well, a laser beam and whoever does not behave, chum, we, we write it down. Okay, yes, write it down. Well, I'm one of those who think that uh, a lot of control, a lot of control should be used, but a control which is slow and then a sanction which is cost effective for the one uh, guilty uh, for is is the same an agency of the competition unless there is a cartel unless they see an infringement or violation they allow him to act what happens uh, when they introduce the sanction maybe it's only three percent of the benefit they they have gathered and the harm has already been caused in my opinion it's a question of placing as many filters as possible before it happens because in the end it's going to be very complicated otherwise so basically this is what we're going to do. Filters, what type of filters? Well, all the filters we are mentioning, not trafficking with data, using the data, for example, when you work on the Uber application, you are accepting that the application is not responsible in case there is an accident, or maybe you're exhibiting all these different issues, and basically that. I don't know, it is obvious everything that has to be protected. That's it. Perfecto, Joseph, dime. Yes. 
If I continue with uh, Tito's comments, I would like to say that one of the questions that has to be pointed to is that from Fronteras Digitales and from any organization that we defend or make statements about uh, taste and habits which reinforce racism, and we ask for the correction of several biases, in a way, it is also important to highlight that, first of all, we are against the logics of the existence of the borders the way they exist. We see that there are alternatives. We have seen it in Ukraine, the way to manage the migratory flows, these necessary legal pathways, because uh, this is already included in the report of the spokesman of the UN, and it shows how this application of systems of artificial intelligence at the frontiers, uh, digital borders, make it more difficult, uh, this migration flows, and they increase the rate of mortality. The more difficult it is, the more people pass away. And we see it in the Canary Islands, in the south of Spain. So in the end, this agency should carry out this exercise, observation, and observation, why not, of the fundamental rights and human rights, taking into account what we said before. So the first right that we are going to call upon is the right to life, but to protect and also to make a contact uh, magnifying lens about how to introduce this uh, frontier, make public these auditing reports and the participation of civil society, participation of civil society, not as a correction element where we can say that civil society is then part of this, but this agency has to become an independent organism joining voices and these voices allow us to design also pay attention as we were saying before to what's happening in Scotland with these assembly tables allowing us to participate in the design of artificial intelligence systems so let's participate in the design but also in systems of artificial intelligence which are operating and generating structural inequalities and also, and let me finish with that, uh, let's say that this system is discriminating and let's end with this system, not to modify it, but we have to finish with this system. And this has to become a function which can be given to this agency. Mm -hmm. well, I agree with what you said. Um, first of all, who says uh, when we talk about the uh, agency, we are talking about the beach bar. Before the, besides the way this um, way this agency is working, anything which is similar to a beach bar agency and autonomy is not working. So we have to take into account all the reforms that are requested for independence of these institutions, etc., in which the the element that I was mentioning is fundamental participation of civil society as a fundamental third actor, public, private. And what does it mean, participation? Because participation given by the left and the right since the 15M, since we requested participation, is trash. This is not what we want. This is a confusion between freedom of expression. So anybody as a cacophony can say, I want this, I want this. And I want facial recognition, I don't want it. Well, Esto this is, is not participation. This is uh, beating, around the, beating around the bush. So participation is, and this is something that we were mentioning before, as uh, Josep has already mentioned, being able to invent. So do what the members of the parliament do or should do, which is to men to propose from a structural point of view, this should be 
open in the Houses of Parliament and the agencies to civil society, inequality of conditions, but also capacity. So I don't think that uh, everybody can always participate. And finally, about algorithms. We have to talk about the possibility to audit because we don't speak about transparency because of a question of intellectual property. Since, uh, from what I have explained before, I don't want to enter into this garden, but in any case, any algorithm paid with public money, there is no reason why it should not be audited and transparent. Algorithms are cooking recipes that somebody develops and the and transparent to everyone. So all these thousands of exceptions that are going to be written down uh, conforming this agency should be to reduce to almost zero disappointments of the auditing systems of the algorithms and see how we make it possible for civil society to participate in an efficient way as our colleagues have just done. Well, perfect. We have uh, several questions. And the first question is for Tito. When you say that the scoring can respond to questions of gender or race, you are being asked whether you have already been through this. Have you seen this happening? Are there people who are having less scores because of this, or is this a question of manipulation? They're asking for more information about it. Objective data of uh, the data I'm communicating to you, we don't have any, but it is obvious. You just have to take a look at the society where we are living, which is completely polarized and due to gender or race. It is obvious that they treat you or they look at you in a different way. In the case of delivering a service, you can imagine that it is obvious that it's already happening. Objective data. There is a very complicated study which proves it, but we have been able to prove that algorithms behave in relation to prices. And it depends on the different trajectories and the routes with more or less purchasing power. And it's the opposite because often algorithms behave in a way that in the neighborhood of a lesser purchasing power, they increase the price. In the more purchasing power, they reduce it in order to select. These are some of the interpretations that we provide and gather we, based on millions of data in order to select the type of clientele, which does not give you any problem. So in the end, who are the biggest thieves? But no, we don't have this data, but we have seen that it has been manipulated. That's obvious. Joseph, we are asked, what do you think about the this course on uh, technology of borders? This discourse, which is like uh, of a benefit instead of risk in general. So this techno solutions that everything can be solved by using technology and it's fantastic because machines can do it what we are seeing permanently nobody's responsible is uh, algorithms are responsible for everything so what do you think about the discourse in the media as a journalist one of the obvious things about these media discourses which in a way gives support or point to these techno solutions that you have mentioned several times, is that mainly you are not going to see anybody, migrant or racial, pointing to this, saying that this type of implementations are going to represent an improvement or anybody who defends the fundamental human basic rights. They are never going to say that uh, to make it more and more difficult for someone to migrate and in the end uh, having him or her undergoing 
hardships to migrate is not going to bring any solution. What is going to bring is that we fall into specific situations that are going to go against their right to life. In the end, what it's usually said is that technology is neutral. And yes, technology can be neutral, but the context where we live is not neutral, as Tito has already mentioned. And Tito was talking about, uh, thinking about the different scorings which are being given to a writer who is someone uh, racialized, someone who is racist, someone we don't like with a negative scoring. We pre-think that this is happening to society, but we cannot believe that intelligence or artificial intelligence systems in themselves are going to be beneficial for everyone because the neoliberal logics do not follow these steps independently of who is governing. We are seeing that the uses and implementations that are being given to artificial intelligence are reinforcing migration control more uh, labor exploitation, and it's happening within a context of profound inequalities from a gender, class, race perspective. So we have to be very careful with this type of discourses. And something that Lucia was mentioning before during the first round table, which is this questioning of the different narrations and being able to have a different narration, making us criticize and question everything as a fundamental premise. Simona, there's a couple of questions for you. Let me see if you can be concise, although I'm not a technological expert, but it's impossible, but I'm sure you are going to be able to do it. On the one hand, the question is related to the software that you mentioned, but also the cloud. How do we solve it? And there are also people who are telling you how we parents can do in order to support what uh, you are doing to withdraw technology from the classroom. That's the double question. Oh, very quickly, there is a problem of connection before internet was free and then the connection uh, was sold to Telefonica for one euro. And now we are facing this problem. I think that we can leave this debate for another day, infrastructure, because it's more uh, from a macro level. And I don't know, we have the Facebook cable and they can provide different routes and they have become more and more privatized. This is a melon to open. We have the private satellites, etc., etc. And then we have the cloud. The cloud are computers. And any, can, anyone can have it. You can set up a company around this. In fact, there was a project called Islanding Modern Media Initiative that back in 2010, I tried to translate into Uruguay, which was the idea of creating an economic niche or base, massive one, in order to develop servers with the special characteristics of respecting human rights and freedom of expression. And this is something that I still believed on. A region or a country can choose it as an economic model because this is something very much needed. And this change towards digital sovereignty, COVID, one of the good things of COVID is that everyone has realized, governments and people, that before the, in the school there was not a huge problem, but now everybody realizes that their children are uh, in the hands of Google, which can do whatever they want with them. And to conclude, just some advertising. If this project really being the digital conquer of Europe is going to be presented Urbi et Orbi as a big international congress in Barcelona on the 12th, 13th and 14th of July, where we're going to present the code and we are going to open it, Moodle, Free Software Foundation, Interpac. We're going to present the code Urbi et Orbi, and we're going to work on the curriculum and how teachers can face the digital without being technologists. I always say that stop 
showing the digital as the exorcist, only the technical part and the police, but there is a culture in which we are living and something that we have to face. And then we invite you, this is something we are providing by Twitter, you can follow our newsletter or search for it in Twitter, and we try to explain what can we do and how quickly this can be implemented, the different tools in the schools, and many of these debates which are going to happen in the next few days, which count as a digital competence for all the teachers, like 20 hours of accreditation for teachers. Great. One of the things that uh, we want to know, as I was saying at the beginning, and what have been the consequences. For example, Simona, in respect, fear, the idea that we have to be technological experts to be part of all this. Let me ask you to encourage people to do it in the three fields of the fight that we are explaining, education, racial discrimination, employment rights. These are central uh, aspects of our society. And more or less, how would you encourage people how to remove this fear from them going into this, from the groups, from your experiences for these organizations and activists as a first step to see where to start? So more or less, what would you tell them, basically? Well, from our experience, it is very gratifying, for example, to see that we can win them, beat them, because Uber uh, is desperate. They have presented eight claims in the Catalan authority where we have a sanctioning file and we can have a fine of uh, two million euros. Uh, they know no problem. I can pay these two million euros. And when they use all these strategies in order to intimidate you and to harass you, because they deploy all the members of the law firm, they go deep into your personal life, they publish fake news. I have suffered all this. And in the end, it is true that you experience some pain for a while, but then you couldn't care less. Let me tell you, I even enjoy it. When, yes, because I think that, for example, in the case of Taxis de Barcelona, I think it's a good mirror to reflect, to see that we can live better without them. We can uh, overcome them with not a lot. We are just hard workers. We don't have 10 million euros. We believe in what we do. And the truth is, that it's gratifying and you feel like continuing. In the case of the observatory, I'm going to give you the example of a busy taxi of Barcelona. Uh, they are going to find an ally in us in order to advise them, guide them, but it's not easy. It's not easy, but uh, we cannot uh, normalize uh, what they are doing. We cannot surrender because it's very serious. They are going deep into our life. They are using uh, our telephones to see our taste. They are poking into our lives. They send you a message so you can buy things that you don't even need. So this is a very complicated world. But you don't have to be an engineer to realize. Maybe some years ago, yes. But now there are many sources of information in order to know how to use your telephone. And there is something also which to me is the most important thing, which is let's stop using the telephone. For example, to ask for food. There are some cooperatives of riders, such as Menchacas, for example. And there are others where we have to be the first one to make some responsible consumption. For example, I can look for a place or an intermediate company 
pues, where I know derecho. that these workers have the specific rights, nobody is stealing from them, and they even participate in the activity which is being carried out and not to contribute because in the end, the international network that we have, there are many workers, especially from California and the United States who are organized, they work for Uber and they fight against Uber. And I tell them, why don't you create an alternative? This is the first premise because you will never achieve specific rights with all this. They are always going to find a hole, they're going to buy someone, they're going to use these millions to keep committing crimes. To us, this is a way of life. It's like a drug. And we cannot stop consuming it. And I encourage people to do it because it's a, an important motivation to wake up every morning. Great. You said very quickly. Yes, and Simona we have only five minutes left. Very quickly, uh, motivation and, and obligation. There's no alternative. In the end, what is at the stake is our rights and our lives. Tito, you were talking about the fact that we are uh, many, but very atomized. And we tend to think I'm not a rationalized migrant person. So whatever is happening at the borders is not going to affect me. Or the way the rational people are being treated through artificial intelligence systems. I'm not a taxi driver. I'm not a rider. And this is a huge mistake. It's a huge mistake because we think that all these uh, using these can be extrapolated to the rest of society and also a limitation of our rights, privacy. And is there where we have to organize ourselves and move among different sectors to see how can we make a stronger fight? And I'm not a specialist in algorithms or artificial intelligence. We have made up a team where we have uh, profiles of different people and we support each other from our knowledge, experiences, and from our tools and capacities. And it is from there where we can build and break this border of ignorance and lack of knowledge. And the first thing they tell you is that I don't know how this is affecting me, but you tell them, and the first thing they tell you is uh, like before, but now with artificial intelligence. So we have to break this barrier of lack of knowledge, contribute with this, and to make people aware so we can relate all these fights and be much stronger, of course. The only thing I should add to all this is that I guess it's happening to many of you with your personal fights, uh, digital rights, nobody could care less, but now there are millions about digital rights like the environment. Now, hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, institutional washers have been created. Any organization has a digital department, even if in reality it's not important. I don't have a department of borders because there are many people who are in charge of this. Uh, but, uh, let me obey like a shoulder often. It may interfere, yes, but not necessarily. Uh, now, all of a sudden, there is a lot of intrusism in the sense that governments need uh, spokesmen of digital rights. They don't want to intervene with those of us who are fighting for them. So uh, many of them are created. So now that many people uh, have to incorporate the digital aspects, all of a sudden you are part of a fight and then the digital is affecting you and you have to be in charge of this. Let me just tell you that we have to be careful with whom we work. And some people are here defending you, defending your rights and helping you not to brainwash the discourse of the system. And I see once again that many left organizations, they want to work well, but uh, they follow this vision of technophobia and condescending of the digital. Well, but you know, this is not real. So let's try to be careful. 
because uh, there are loads of uh, fake people. I think that it's crystal clear, your message. In any case, uh, thank you so much to the three of you. This was the purpose. We wanted to encourage people for them to realize that this will have an impact on our daily lives, but it's possible with a tiny effort to face them and at least not to, well, escape with their own ideas. A lot of people are realizing that alliances are vital. We can make it possible. And this was the main idea when we invited the three of you. I do encourage you, and I'd like to invite you to read a little bit the discussion and this thread that we have in the chat after your comments. Uh, if the email, amongst other services, should be a public good, we will uh, offer quality to privacy. This is the will that we have, right? We want to create this kind of debates. And we finish on time. Noon plus one minute. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to those following us. Because we really wanted with this uh, big amount of energy and good mood. And now... Well, now we have a, like a very short break for you to drink a coffee and to be stronger. We'll see you at uh, half past 12 with an amazing panel of the digital rights colonization. And that's all. I hope to see you in a half hour. Thank you so much. And we are going to complete a little bit more this uh, speech, this narrative, uh, getting new ideas to carry on. Thank you very much. Have a good morning, Simona, Monse, Tito, Joseph. See you in half hour, right? That's all. Take a break, drink a coffee, and well, we are full of energy. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bueno, bienvenidas de nuevo a todas. Welcome back again to you all. I think that we had time for a coffee. Sorry, because I forgot my mic on. That's live. Thankfully, we're not broadcasting on TV. And now we'll have a new panel that, uh, well, had loads of expectations. And I'm thinking that it's going to be very interesting. Decolonizing digital rights at global perspective with immediate action. And we have as a moderator, Olivia G. Palino, a data scientist with an anti racism, anti colonization perspective. She's mapping uh, resistance projects and technology appropriation, focusing on AI projects. Welcome, Olivia. It is a pleasure to have it amongst us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Judith, for this kind introduction. Well, we're going to open this panel, which is the icing on the cake after several workshops that we've been organizing from uh, Societat Oberta Space about decolonization of technology, as Judith mentioned. We began in February with an introduction session. What was the role of the process? And after that, we had two workshops and we're sharing resistant projects from a closer context, the European context. We also added some strategies in order to know what's the decolonization perspective in social organizations, aiming to those groups that have a direct contact with individuals that could be impacted by the constant systematization of this reality, our reality. We'd like to underline the work made by the Digital Freedom Fund and EDRIC, they both created a collaborative space with the different groups and collectivities belonging to civil society, aiming to reach a decolonization of these groups. Thanks to the work that they developed, we learned about the importance to create a collaborative process. The feeling of belonging should be a key factor in this kind of discussion to debate and create strategies. It's not a result of a single day of work. We need to witness the needs and the weaknesses of the most vulnerable communities, be able to listen to them and to implement their desires. At the international level, we count with Arco Race, one of the organizers of this seminar. Its recent creation underscores the importance to engage social stakeholders in social sphere. They are boosting different dialogues amongst the racialized communities, the use of AI in Spanish state. They are gathering doubts, also troubles, for them to be aware about the impact of the AI in these groups of population. All along this session, we want to get closer to the importance to add new approximations through technology from an anti-racism, feminist, and decolonial uh, perspective, to understand what does decolonizing digital rights means and to know the resistance activities all over the world. And also to know other strategies that were developed here in Spain. It will allow us to know what were the groups and collectivities dreaming about having a more human technology adapted to nowadays times. Therefore, in order to open this discussion and to carry on with our seminar, I'd like to introduce the uh, uh, members of the panel. We do have amongst us uh, Paula Ricaurte. Paula Ricaurte, she is a researcher working at the Monterrey Institute in Mexico and Professor Bermenchain Center of the Intermain and Internet Society at the University of Harvard and co-founder of the organization Tierra Común. We also have Paula. She is a member of the Alliance A Plus for Inclusive Algorithms. She is fostering the Latin American and Caribbean Center of the Feminist Network of AI, the FDRI system, so-called also Interferencias Organization. We also have a Paula de la Oz and Sentinel One in Madrid. She is a professor at the pen testing at Harvard and hacking at the school Salesianos from Atocha. 
She is the president and co-founder of Interferencias, an association for data privacy in the internet. She is also a speaker at Radio Vallecas with a broadcast program about the social responsibility. With any further to say, I'd like to greet to all of you, Paola and Paula. How are you? Hello, we are delighted, so happy to be amongst you. Cool. Thank you very much for your amazing collaboration and for accepting our invitation in this panel. I'd like to break the ice with a question. And it says, how can we let people know people are watching us and following us from the YouTube channel, why is it important to decolonize and to have a feminist perspective when dealing with the digital rights and offering a new perspective to technology? How you will describe this new situation? Thank you. I don't know, maybe Paula, would you like to break the ice? Well, thank you so much for the question thank you very much for inviting me thank you for the opportunity to have this chat with you these are very urgent subjects and it's uh, really necessary to broaden our discussion fields when they're dealing with the new technologies as for the question related with the digital rights i think that it's quite relevant it's relevant because sometimes we build some narratives uh, in relationship uh, with uh, what we consider that it's relevant, that really deserves to have more attention from our side. From a Latin perspective, I think that we need to talk about decolonizing digital rights in a double fold manner. On the first hand, there are some agendas that are imported from the outside due to the funding institutions, and many other things that are happening in contexts that are in our uh, are not our contexts. The funding uh, institutions they bring some perspectives, and the local communities they have to absorb these perspectives for them to survive. But there is another way that to me it's much more profound that have to do with decolonizing digital rights. To me, it starts with decolonizing human rights. Sometimes we normalize and we do believe that human rights, well, are a level that really allows us to talk about all the multiple rights that we require. But on the other hand, I see that nowadays we need to go beyond. We need to decentralize a human right, not only from an anthropocentrical perspective, but also we need to include a new perspective where human rights are only rights for a very specific groups of people. Decolonize human rights, it's something vital to broaden and to be aware about the damages that some communities will suffer. Damages and dangers that go beyond the human environment because sometimes these human uh, communities, they live and they are not connected. So. To me, I think that it is important to broaden the role of rights, talk about the human rights, nature rights as a whole, and to broaden human rights agendas to include not only aspects that are once again basic, such as privacy, but we need to include other additional aspects that we really require for communities to reach better existence uh, conditions. Well, I do agree with everything that Paola has mentioned, but dealing with the digital and technology issues, we uh, think that when we talk about the relationship between people and technology, we talk about people as consumers. So, in the middle, we introduce this uh, concept of consumer. We are not the builders of this new reality. If we talk about uh, consumers of technology instead of builders and creators of technology, we are uh, fostering more what Paola said. There is not a, an active participation of the digital aspects and we will have always some situations where users won't play an active role. They will be only the companies 
that manages social media and the big tech corporations. So many, many times we will witness that a lot of people will be the outsiders. They will be marginal. These people won't, will, won't have the resources to overcome these kind of issues and to be able to build these new strategies. So if we have this kind of a private technology system, we are not respecting digital rights. Mainly, there won't be a digital voice to promote these rights, to protect our privacy and being anonymous. These are flexible resources that should get adapted to people's needs instead of globalizing that needs that we have as a user. So this is kind of an illusion that we only have in, a, in social media and technology. So in order to offer my support to Paola's world, I think that we need to create a much more accessible technology and to have a programmers, engineers, able to create efficient products and to have a much more open uh, technology building and thinking about technology from other perspectives. Paola, as for these agendas that were imported, right, in Latin, it is important to know how are we importing digital rights? Rights from Europe dealing with material issues uh, going to other southern regions of the world and how many, many times we copy paste the European perspectives in the global south. What do you think about this copy paste strategy? <laughs> Well, uh, it is a very interesting question, you know, because let's think about a basic right, a human basic right, which is a privacy. And one could assume that we see privacy from the same perspective, and we all need to fight for this single kind of privacy. However, sometimes in a different context, different regions, not the ones that we have in the industrialized countries, we do not consider these differences, such as the uh, world uh, vision uh, that we have and the reality of our daily lives, as uh, Paula mentioned. In a disconnected context, which are the majority of contexts in Latin American region, in a disconnected context, this notion of privacy from an individual perspective doesn't exist. It is not possible at all. There are some families sharing their cell phone. They share almost everything because they don't have resources. This is something that we witnessed during the pandemics and lockdowns. Well, a family that had only a cell phone for their kids to get connected to virtual classes. We cannot talk about individual terms when we're dealing with their privacy. We need to talk about privacy in collective terms. So. We need to question how are we building these ideas towards technology. This should be the first step. I do agree with Paula, completely agree with Paula, because the technologies that we have today are technologies that by definition impact our daily rights. These are hegemonic technologies, right? Not the ones that come from communities, but the hegemonic technologies, the ones that we see from top to down, they impose us a narrative with regards the relationship that we must have with technology. And we, as individuals living our daily life, mediated in a digital manner, we must accept and tolerate. That's why we need to rethink and to dismantle this kind of imposed narratives that we all assume internally and to know what would be our new relationship with the technology and what technology should be. Together with many friends, we think about this kind of issues, right? And we need to rethink technology, not only as device, being the builders, not only consumers of technology. To what extent, right? The vocabulary and the terminology words that we use to change the terms and the concepts once we talk about technology, right? What would be the words that we should introduce and to change the meaning and maybe to create new words, right? To give a new meaning and to have a constructive words. You know what happened? 
I think that this kind of task, it's very important because the majority of alternatives that we have when dealing with this kind of technologies that would be too much globalized and uh, too much uh, private. These technologies were built in such a manner and environment that could be very toxic. Uh, well, sometimes they could go against some communities. Having in mind the idea that we need to fight against some lobbies and to create a open source technology and a friendly technology, the uh, language transformation, it's key. So we must be builders, not consumers. So changing this perspective, it's vital. We realized that once we had uh, our workshops, people came to our workshops a little bit sad, they came a very humbly to our workshops. They told us, well, I don't know a lot about IT. I'm not a programmer. However, they use a lot of Linux and they were aware about their servers and they knew very well their, their servers. But they don't see themselves as someone powerful because they are not technicians. They are not techie people, right? And this was uh, something important to us. It was a very big problem to us. We didn't need these kind of interactions at the end of the day. And finally, we need that. Personally speaking, I do believe that feminist groups, decolonizer groups, all of us, they are fundamental to get involved in order to offer a pers real perspective about our needs. If everything that we have to build this new technology and we only count with the IT people, we only have the perspective of the IT people. We need a much for technology and a necessary technology always taking into account the resources that we'll have in the future. We cannot keep the pace because the environment problems uh, won't allow us to have the rhythm and the pace that we have. This kind of discourse can be only created if we are able to talk with associations dealing with this kind of uh, problems. In trans-feminist groups, we talk a lot about care and the concept of care does not belong at all when dealing with IT people, right? We need to talk about care, building communities, we need to insist in this kind of perspective. These are the main pillars. We need to talk about communities. Instead of talking about what do I need, we need to talk about what do we need. We need to talk about uh, builders and not consumers, not programmers anymore. We need to talk about what do we need and what can we make possible. These are the key elements. Be aware about the needs and what would be the real roles that we will be playing in the future. Very important year contribution. How to include the concept of care. This is something that we always take into account in any kind of social organization. And sometimes we forget the concept of care in the digital levels and in the capitalism perspective. The next question would be this one. Why do you believe that it is important to face technology from a decolonizing and feminist and anti-racist perspective? To what extent is this important? Why this perspective were not included before and were not under the radar of uh, so many people? Well, if you allow me, I'd like to answer to your question. Something that Paola mentioned before was that we disconnect technology from care. We disconnect technology from care, feelings, sensitiveness, these technologies, they have an effect on a very specific bodies and territories. I do guess that the contribution from feminism, community, intersectional, decolonization, they put at the center this need to rethink technology 
under the terms of care that need to be placed at the center of everything. I do agree with Paul, I guess. We need to broaden the impact. We need to broaden the impact of technology and to go beyond that and to consider human rights and digital rights and to broaden the consideration of the impact because there are straightforward impacts in our physical bodies, in our minds, in on the territories that we are not taking into account. We are living a historical moment that explains why this new framework is having a bigger impact in many people. We are experiencing a crisis in our civilization, health, human, environmental crisis. I do believe that technology infrastructures, they have a very important role to play. As it happened before in feminism times, when we start opening our eyes and being aware about this new reality, it is incredible, but we do not have a single technology environmental friendly, such as all technologies that belong to capitalism. They get rid of the bodies, they get rid of the surface, the land, the territories. We are kind of blind people and we are not aware about how we will pay data centers. And in order to keep data centers, we need to steal water from communities we do not want to see and we try to escape from this reality. We think about technologies as consumers and we do not think that we should stop consuming and not to buy such a big amount of devices because the environmental impact is huge and is against individuals and the environment. I have a dear friend, she's called, her name is Jess. She works in Chiapas. We talked about the impact of the technology here in Mexico and the impact on the workers, women workers, uh, the water, river water pollution that are placed in the Mexican Silicon Valley on the companies and factories. No one talks about it. So how, how can we improve here? How can we raise the standards of technologies and uh, techie corporations towards the communities and the role that we can play us, ourselves, as members of these networks that use today about it? Why is that important? And to what extent we can include this kind of rights in the technology arena? In line with the previous comments, there are some values that can fit brilliantly in this kind of spheres. There is a very thin line. We talk a lot about technology diversity, but it's a profitable diversity. We look for technology diversity to have a much more profitable uh, product. This is kind of a trap. Our mind creates these kind of associations. We talked about diversity and decolonization and this kind of ideas, right? But is the goal realistically this one? Is this what we are aiming for? We need to include this kind of concepts and what all the associations could say, have to say about technology and diversity. Sometimes we want to count with this kind of people, but we forget our main purpose. We need to bear in mind why are we looking for this kind of diversity and to have a bigger why. It is important to have a community visibility, not only an individualistic visibility inside what we consider this kind of demographies and group of population to build a new concept of uh, technology communities. Thus, in conclusion, I'd say that it is important to differentiate the technology that we will need in the future. That's why we need to have conversations with people that really need technology, as Paola mentioned before, and how to, um, I read many, many things about this issue and you wrote a lot about it. And 
we do not only think about what's profitable and efficient, and that's why we are looking for these kind of associations. We are looking for new associations to have better and much more friendly technology. To look for a better technology, a friendlier technology, whether if we have to make a step backwards, whether if we need to go backwards and not to see such a high performance technology, maybe we should be slower and things will be better on a long-term basis. We need this scope of a long-term basis. I'd like to ask you something, Paula. Should we realistically to make a step backwards when we rethink things? No. I'm telling you, step backwards when dealing with uh, technology skills instead of using, let's say, a huge data center to high performance data center, let's go backwards and to use something that we had in the past. Maybe it was slower, or let's think about slower new technologies, but could be better on a long term basis. We usually say a lot in our radio station, Radio Vallecas, we talk a lot about technology. We always say this idea, low tech, high life. We, should, we usually listen high tech and so on and so forth, right? So less technology, but a bigger quality of life. Paula mentioned before something that we do not take into account because usually we don't think in these uh, terms. There are uh, some communities creating decentralized systems or technology, and they are thinking about using renewable energies to use technology. So this kind of uh, tiny changes offer uh, some hope to me from a technological perspective. So I just wanted to mention this, right? So we should have a break, rethink and react. And to be more patient, why not? Yes, be more patient. I do have another question for you. What are the uh, worries and that you have when dealing with the algorithms to take a perspective, the decolonizing feminist uh, perspective and what would be the rights that you observe for democracy? Well, this question is a very complicated one. All of the questions that you are asking are fundamental. I was, I published a very short texts about ethics and ethics for the majority of uh, the world. When we talk about the impact of algorithms and how do they impact? There is kind of a disconnection of the impact in the majority of the world, in the majorities that we do not consider. To me, we do have to contemplate these impacts on democracy, on people in the different territories as a process where several mechanisms are activated. To me, there are epistemic mechanisms that have an impact on the daily life of people. Those uh, processes, they have to do with the uh, trafficking, the extraction, the use of bodies in the territories with an algorithmic mediation process. As I mentioned before, it is such embedded in our lives, but suddenly, it becomes a tool for states to automatize the oppression, as it was mentioned by Ora Joana Baron and Paz Peña. It's kind of a mechanism, intertwined mechanisms that have as a final effect mentioned by Stiller, the automation of existence, of sensitiveness. And this is what really worries me. We talk about democracy, but we need to think about these impacts on democracy as an impact that come from these macro structure aspects to the much more micro uh, 
sensitiveness of the people existence. And as we said since the beginning, these impacts are kind of differentiated amongst bodies, amongst individuals, amongst territories in the planet. So these impacts are distributed and costs. They are on the shoulders of the majority of the people. In my case, I think that what worries me most in reality is on the one hand that uh, these automized dynamics become a public standard without protecting part of society, uh, maybe because this advancement does not go hand in hand uh, with the right uh, to replica. And this is something that uh, has been asked when we were in Spain, they wrote a letter, a charter of uh, digital rights. And there was the right to reply by the citizens where they were thinking about uh, different uh, problems that had to be included. And one of them was to speak about how to make a fair process of decision by algorithms, the right of objection. And the problem was always there. If there is right of objection, they do exist, but there's no transparency about the way this decision is being, is being taken. And maybe that person is objective uh, about this and how everything is done. And if it's not accompanied by transparency, the right to revision can only be marginalized. And on the other hand, I'm also worried because in general, an increase and an optimized bureaucracy will generate a society which is subject to the condescendences of uh, technology. I think that technology is considered like something supranatural. Uh, you cannot uh, refuse what it says. It has become condescending and it's uh, mathematic. If you apply some automatic terms in public questions, well, this feeling will be increasing among the members of society, and then there's going to be much more uh, condescending uh, attitude of the powers and a more aggressive uh, relation between computer lobbies and the rest of society. So I'm a bit worried. How is it possible to have a big differentiation between people who are uh, part of the computer experts and those who are not. And on the other hand, this lack of coordination between the lack of transparency and also how to apply automated processes in something that is going to be imposed to us. So this is one of the main worries. Precisely. Paula, I think that you wanted to mention something. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it really resonates what uh, Paula has already mentioned. And I think that this idea I was sharing about the framework presented by Joana Barona Paspeña, which I think is fantastic, is how to think this process of automation of the state as a real automation process, which is searching how to operate in order to automatize different neoliberal policies to automatize the vigilance of the poor people and to automatize racism. How to think about this process of automation of the state of public policies have direct effects in order for a mechanism of uh, responsibility of the state existing. And narratives are very powerful. Let's solve this problem and let's decide who is going to receive a social benefit. But all this is just reproducing these huge asymmetries. And in a way, the way artificial intelligence is being used, at least in Latin America, is precisely to automate 
poverty to optimize these huge inequalities that we have. So for me, this is a huge danger because then going back to democracy, we want to optimize the different social processes and so nobody is responsible for them. I think it's interesting the fact that in the end, we make automatism, for example, talking about the global south, automation of certain rights in this case, without taking into account that many of the people who could benefit from this are never going to receive it because they are not part uh, of the entity of this automation process, or maybe they don't have a device with which to connect to this by saying, there I am. I want to be able to join this and I want to be able to enjoy it. But the fact that uh, maybe you don't have this type of uh, literacy, digital literacy, means that there is a barrier for uh, many of the people who really need uh, this help. And you, Paula, I think you were saying, which is very interesting, speaking about or speaking about technology as they were gods, and this is what's happening. Therefore, from now on, there is no right to objection, but the right to objection is quite limited then. So if you agree before answering the following question, I would like to remind you that we have the Menti channel to show you and what the different questions and to indicate uh, completely different questions. The following question I have for you is the following. What are the initiatives or examples that you are aware of which can serve as an inspiration? inspiration to reimagine the technology that we have uh, nowadays. As Paola was saying, and I completely agree with this, the initiatives that give me hope are the ones coming from communities. And these initiatives, we have many all over the world. In Latin America, we have technological communities which are working in order to build these horizons of uh, autonomy, as Estefania Severo says, uh, working towards technologies which are developed and transformed from community values. There is an activist and linguist, uh, Mije, Jasnaya Aguilar here in Mexico, and she speak about techologies. And I think this is very interesting because this idea that techio is an ancestral practice shared by many communities in Latin America, uh, different ways in Andine, it's called Minga in Brazil, Mochirao, and they are practices which are based on several principles, ancestral one, pre-Hispanic ones, and they are related to redistribution. So to think about technologies from the principle of reciprocity, I think it's fundamental in order to relate these discussions that we have about affects, care, and technological impacts. If we think as technologies as a community construction, of course, these considerations were uh, that are not being taken into account can be incorporated in order for us to imagine other technologies and other possible futures. Initiatives from the communities in Mexico, in Latin America, there are many. We have technological cooperatives, communities of reflection, and there are also uh, other uh, technologies. And I think that, uh, and Paula can mention several, and I can mention uh, several 
ones, uh, the technological cooperative, etc. In Brazil, we have Media Lab, uh, we have Common Rights in Brazil, in Argentina, there is one of artificial intelligence, there is a federation of technological cooperatives, for example, and in Colombia, we have a collective which works on the idea of pocket technologies. We have several initiatives working on the perspective of uh, minimal computation, and there is also perspectives speaking technologies, solar technologies, and plural technologies. Uh, initiatives. And as I was saying, these are the ones that provide me hope. We think, well, I just want to add what uh, Paola was saying from the point of view of minimum complication. I'm fascinated and I have been trying to follow these uh, communities. And for example, Caracolito, which uh, works basically as a collection of resources and pages of minimum technology. Uh, not only technologies, but also food and self-management. Uh, but they are also using the Gemini protocol, which is alternative to the users, which are the ones used by these technologies and the ones that we could uh, use altogether. And I think that the most interesting thing is not the protocol, but the idea that these resources are being generated in order to uh, create this type of alternatives or uh, alternative and renewable energies. For example, uh, in, the fact, in the case of the local technology, that is to say technology uh, doing internet and maybe trying to use uh, technology is less abrasive and in this sense i think this is a great example to follow a couple of people who have created a 100 lobby community and basically they live in a, on a boat and they also work on computers but they do it themselves and they have a book and they have published on the internet etc and everything they do even the same program they use to make a presentation. For example, uh, they have been doing it, it without the internet, even if it takes several months. I'm not saying this is a solution, but it does generate several questions and discourses, thinking about technology in a different way. So in this sense of uh, minimum complication. I think that these resources are fantastic and they have helped me to rethink my day to day, something I'm working on now. And question to feminisms, for example, I think I really like Laboria Comunis, which is um, a group of women trying to make essays from a philosophical point of view but to rethink the way we're using technology. Despreciar todo lo patriarcal que podamos encontrar dentro de nuestra tecnología del día a día, lo cual seguramente es bastante más de lo que podemos imaginarnos. Y ellas hacen ese esfuerzo de intentar eh, tirarlo todo y empezar de cero para intentar construir algo que no le conviene identidades nuevas. Me encanta, me parece súper refrescante y no tienes por qué... Um, and I love it. And you don't have to know absolutely nothing about computers. You don't have to know how to use a computer in order to understand uh, what they are talking about. So I think it's super important. And as far as other skills, uh, maybe this is an opportunity for the universe because I think that most of the problems that we are having about uh, anxieties related to internet is because of the social media. And I think that this uh, social media that are having 
more important, for example, Twitter. Uh, let's try uh, Mastodon, which is part of the bigger network, where they use a more friendly um, social media when there is assemblies, where they try to create uh, creators and builders of all the users in a way that uh, we get to know the administrators, we can ask for new things and maybe y, eh, aunque sirven thing, para lo mismo porque son redes sociales, although they are used for the same thing because we are talking about social media, but they allow us to take a look at the uh, social media as something that you belong to. So you are a builder also of this social media. And on the other hand, you take care of it and you take care of the people there. Conversations are more friendly. There is not an algorithm behind in order for you to respond. We can create and to be uh, social media. It's much better to call this social media than what we call social media. So this is what I wanted to tell you to conclude with my recommendations and mentioning all the institutions that want to approach this type of technology to people uh, without interferences or even from the hat lab or the TCO that we can find in many places. Obviously, I recommend uh, Villana of Casa Madrid where I participate, but there are many in different countries and I'm sure that uh, Paula can also think uh, of many others where she has participated. And if you do some searching, you will for sure find uh, others like this one. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for the initiatives, because sometimes you start searching and you don't know where to search. So I thank you for being able to provide so many ideas from different spheres and applications and people who think about uh, a new way of connecting to people, connecting people to their beliefs and ideas they might have. So once again, thank you very much for the brainstorming and the different ideas that you have provided in a maximum of uh, 10 minutes. If you agree, let's start with a round of questions. We have one, Paula, for you. Since you have referred to a report of a study about the technological machine in Mexico, so can you tell us about a link or somewhere where we can find this uh, message? This report is a report which is called His Watch and every year is promoted by APC and this is related to technology, the environment and also looking about how these responses from the global south. So this is something you can have. His hey, yes, watch like mirar. I think this is what I wrote here. And there you can find many cases all over the world from the global south where you can find consultations about this nexus between technological development and environmental impacts. And of course, in the communities and territories. Of course, there are many in the countries. It's a very interesting report. I highly recommend you because uh, there uh, you will find very interesting information. The following question I have is for both of you. And it's related to the role that education can play from very early ages in order to promote a critical thinking, not only about technology, but other aspects. Yes, if Paula allows me, I would like to start by answering this question because this is very interesting for me since uh, I have been educated from very early ages and we have uh, tried to provide some alternative to Google, Microsoft, and the pandemia, uh, trying to install this in several educational centers. So I think that we are implementing efforts in creating little humans who know computing, 
and programming and go directly into how to defend in an engineer, but not often do we see if these things are necessary or they allow them to express their ideas like these ones. So I think it's very important that uh, in an early education, we have conversations at the same time without the computer um, to think about the technology they use on the day to day and having a talk to them and saying, well, what do you use? The console, the computer, your mobile phone? And do you think this can be replaced by something else? Or what makes this work? And what do you need in order to have electricity? So this type of conversation is necessary because otherwise people go directly to building things in the future without knowing what is behind. So I think it's super important. And it's also very important what we were saying before in storing alternatives and choosing maybe not to create a Google account at the age of 10 or not having to use an online Microsoft class and then trying to use a free one, which makes me, uh, they can change. And I think that we're still on time been able to do this, but as I was saying, it's been quite an important battle because after the pandemic, there has been a total uh, private, public, um, public things. And I think that, for example, we can learn quite a lot from this in Latin America because, correct me if I'm wrong, they have moved many more initiatives as far as free software within educational centers. I don't know if it is like this. Well, there are many differences among countries. For example, a country which I think it's exemplary during the Mojica government in Uruguay, it's because they launched a policy of free software from the level of public policy and education was redefined according to these technologies. And I think it's fundamental, this question on education, because I think that there is like an institutional movement, very powerful, which captures childhood from very early ages in order to become users in this perspective of users of software and technology without what Paula was mentioning, without any type of reflection about this uh, from the point of view of uh, capturing. Well, let's go back to subjectivities, but the colonization of thinking uh, relation with technology does not only mean to use it and operate in it, but it means how do you understand the world from this. And without this critical reflection, we are creating people, as Paula was saying, that they cannot connect uh, with this technology and they don't relate how these technologies are relating and modeling several behaviors and behaviors with other people and the environment. So for me, education is fundamental, but from a critical perspective and from a perspective about the consequences of technology. And I completely agree with Paula, thinking about technology, not from the use of devices, but thinking about technology as something and what implies for the construction of uh, society. And it's a huge challenge for educational systems and educational institutions, because this is not something that we are doing very well. Well, the truth is that it's very difficult trying to build, since you are very little, trying to build a different reality from the one uh, that the rest of your colleagues are building. And how many technological companies feed you to compete since you are very young? International competitions to see who is the youngest developer to bring them for several years to the US, but these people never come back to their country of origin and they never make any contribution to their society. They just keep contributing to the capitalist uh, society, but uh, they never contribute to the places where they come from. Paula, I have a question related to what you were saying, constructing people. Because the question is the following, in what way 
can someone become a constructive person when we have not been educated in this type of uh, digital and diverse literacy? Although I think that you can answer, any of you can answer this question. Well, to provide the perspective from the non-technical point of view, is usually, well, I don't like to use these type of expressions, but it's a slap in the face to people who have been growing in a constant digital literacy. They've always had an iPad with the new technologies, for example. And not necessarily this digital literacy means that there is more control on what happens in society, but this is just on the other side. And if these people are within a rural context or a context with low connectivity or where there is no constant access to the internet, no matter how much they are uh, good at turning on a computer or making an algorithm or connect to internet, they won't be able to abstract this information to these needs. So we need these type of realities in order to create a discourse about how to create more equal communities, more useful communities in this context. For the same reason that we were mentioning before, just an assembly and a brainstorming about the different needs and the resources that we have in order to build these needs will mean something of value in order to be constructive, meaning that it's not a question of uh, I'm a user and I have some ideas about how to improve my experience with this program or this social network, etc. But they are going even farther back in the process of uh, technological creation and to rethink if this social media that has been built, this technology, something that you have created in the computer, for example, a device that has been created is useful or can become more flexible or can be different. And this will mean that it's useful for a society. So in general, someone who is not uh, digital illiterate can contribute with ideas in a recent discourse. So these type of things are not considered because maybe they're not efficient or it means you have to start all over again. Efficient from a capitalist perspective, but they do find a place in free software. And this is why this type of experiences, which are empirical and social, are the ones we need more than ever, more than something provided by someone who is an expert at computers. I don't know if I have explained what you wanted me to explain. I think so. Paola, would you like to say something. Well, going back to decolonization, we have to decolonize education and the way we understand the learning processes to begin with. So this will be the first point. I think the school has programmed us to say we have to do things in a certain way. The teacher is teaching and we are the learners. And this is another uh, battleground that I'm fighting. And something that was mentioned by Paula a moment ago, for the question related to learning, I believe in the community. Let's start by thinking that in order to learn, we can learn with other people. We have uh, technological communities. I didn't mention it before, but we have Racho Electronico, which is uh, an, a space where they work from this idea of learning. So this is a learning community and groups are created where uh, they search for knowledge altogether. So someone is saying, I have an interest in learning this. Who knows about this? So they keep working together and collaborating. So let's think about how to expand these possibilities, how to learn, how to be closer through this relationship and this collective learning. This will be my reflection. Thank you very much, Paula. Other questions? Well, what kind of, uh, let's say, concessions 
can we offer to democratize the access of more people into uh, digital infrastructures without compromising their rights? Well, I didn't mention before, however, to me, it is uh, fundamental, the access to the infrastructures. However, we talk uh, very low about the infrastructure as uh, something that was there, allowing the other things to happen. Here, there is a project that I think that it's marvelous and has to do with uh, uh, indigenous communities. And this project that for many years has been working against Mexican state that inhibits these in community initiatives. And well, we have this indigenous uh, community and uh, in a territory that it's a very complex due to uh, geographical uh, conditions. And in a certain manner, I'm not telling you that it's simple. There are some obstacles. Uh, we have uh, some obstacles to the today, again, so fighting this powerful narrative of new generations. But uh, this uh, attempt to find new possibilities through technology are very valuable to offer us that there are other uh, ways to think technology from community and from closer realities and to think that are not impossible and unattainable uh, alternatives. Wherever we see a collective project, we can create any kind of infrastructure project. So any kind of, collect of collective project should ask what would be the infrastructures. And from then on, we should rethink about how can we manage these infrastructures that will allow autonomy and uh, project sustainability on a long-term basis. This is not something of the future, and these are projects that already exist with some effort. They uh, are subsisting because the obstacles goes from the macro to the micro. There are loads of uh, projects for uh, many projects and in Latin America and also in Spain. And we have to look there and to see what are the infrastructures and what can we do? With Paula's uh, perspective, I think that I, there was a book called After the Internet. I do remember pretty much and pretty well because it mentioned many of the things that we are dealing with now. They create, they called a native community that created a device such as uh, an app such as uh, Facebook to create something that was a tribal piece and it was adapted to their tribal needs. And it's like another drop of water in the ocean that we are adding to these uh, whole uh, new possibilities. And it's something very inspiring. And uh, we already have this kind of technologies at the end of the day, and we can always learn of it. And um, we can always uh, offer the details and the needs, and it seems that we need a flexible technology. So we are always uh, contributing and we are always uh, offering all the information. I love a good uh, document. I don't think that an interesting code or interesting technology needs a well-adapted and suitable uh, documentation. I think that, well, we need to document it and we need to create uh, how to implement everything. It is important not only to use this uh, specific one, but also because a uh, very modular and tiny part of the technology will be useful to use something from scratch, such as the tribal uh, strategy that uh, Paula was talking about in an autonomous manner. I'm a big supporter of uh, self-management, not uh, from an individual perspective, but also from a rather from a collective perspective, I guess. And undoubtedly, the access to the internet and access to the technology should be open to all of us. And it should be something that we will take for granted in the public sphere, but it's not always possible. So 
Self-management in communities is something fundamental. Well, very interesting and very important. The uh, base structure has to be done, taking into account loads of perspectives as much as possible, and everything has to uh, be uh, done since the beginning. And uh, non-digital products, this is what we are asking for at the end of the day. So it is interesting how to create from structures that will have a solid basis and specific basis that will get adapted to the community we want to work with. Another question that we have here for you, what are the actions that we should uh, implement uh, in the field of the digital rights? I think that you already mentioned something during this uh, conversation, but maybe you have to, mm, you can give us new ideas. Well, I'd like to insist on this idea and what I mentioned before, which could be the next one. We need to think about our own agendas. We need to think about our uh, digital rights. What do we need? We also need to expand the idea of digital rights beyond that and to contemplate the impacts and the damages that are caused through the use of technologies. We also need to think about these digital rights. And we, as an organization, we need to rethink about it, right? And to think about collective digital rights. We are so far, uh, we are still very far. We are not able to think about collective digital rights. We need to go beyond individual digital rights because the impacts are collective. They affect communities, territories, and we need to think on a global basis, right? We can see big opportunities to think about these uh, collective digital rights, rights that should be uh, shared. And I insist in the idea, this vision of uh, digital rights, we need to dismantle it, and we need to rethink it, we need to scratch the surface and to go deeper and to think what uh, privacy means when we are in different contexts. What does uh, fighting for the rights that will uh, get us more involved and go beyond individuals? And we need to grow towards this direction and to think about digital rights in the context of the climate crisis. And these huge and terrible differences existing all over the planet that are bigger due to the technological impact, right? So there is kind of a bio necro -techno -political device that we need to dismantle and to attack because there are loads of problems and we are at risk. So we need to be more self-demanding. These are very difficult conditions. We need to rethink, we need to change this framework, otherwise we'll get short. I do agree with everything that you said, but when you talked about uh, the question, right, the, 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 the last thing, that you said, how we face the technology resources, it's like uh, there will be no uh, future. And this is what we are making, right? And uh, it seems that one of the fundamental questions that we have for digital rights, it is to really uh, think about what kind of a digital context we want to interview. And obviously, we need to get adapted to the community needs. And I think that it is fundamental what you mentioned before that have to do with education. Because at the end of the day, obviously we all have a time to build and to recycle and to repair and restore. But it's important to convey this message to the new generations. Otherwise we'll fight against the past We'll fight against the future. We need, to, first of all, to educate in digital rights. We need to get trained in a much more friendly technology. 
and to have a much more diverse technology. And obviously, we need to think this, uh, rethink the uh, troubles from an uh, environmental perspective, because uh, sometimes we have so many problems in the world that it's going to be more difficult that digital rights and individual rights that the ones that Paola was uh, telling, right? Not only from a collective perspective, it's difficult to talk about it. If we talk about uh, if someone is on the verge of being evicted from their house, well, they're not going to listen to you. It's something understandable. And we need to talk uh, uh, always in relationship with digital rights and other rights. It's kind of a complicated work. Very interesting and very important how to find these uh, cross-related rights together with technology. I think that, Paula, with your last intervention, we are going to close this uh, panel. It was a very productive panel. I do really thank you. Thank you so much for creating these ideas. And uh, mainly because you offered us some hope, we will be able to find new alternatives we will be able to find new projects. We will be able to reimagine things to come. And we'll touch upon this this afternoon, but also the other days in Barcelona and Madrid. But from uh, your panel, from this panel, I'd say I'd like to underscore the idea that it is important to create a community and to create this uh, feeling of uh, belonging in a binding manner for things to appear in a free manner, in a very creative manner, in an imaginative manner, because sometimes we lack imagination and always to take into account the concept of care, to put care at the center of the process when creating, when designing the initiatives. So thinking about the structures that will be valuable and valid since the beginning for each and every one of our realities and collective realities and the people that create these communities. The idea of thinking that a community is a great fixed block, that's not real. Inside a community, we have loads of colors, different ideas, beliefs, and it's important to merge them all together and to create realities, yes, realities inside the digital uh, world, inside the cloud that will be totally different than plural realities that will show us how the world is today. Paula, you talked before about majorities and uh, the majorities, they always appear as minorities, but they really are majorities. And also the idea of uh, trying to have access, to have a transparent and clear access towards what kind of technology are we consuming today? And to be aware about it and the importance that the boys and girls in the very early stage of their lives, they should new, know new ways for creating, and not only with the help of a platforms that are very consolidated, they could be creative with other uh, platforms and we should give these platforms new opportunities. Having said this, uh, Judith, and in order to conclude, I'd like to mention something. During Barcelona's and Madrid sessions, we will talk about, and uh, we will have kind of a discussion, but also we'll have an exhibition about uh, digital rights decolonization. We will offer our point of view and what are the proposals from Barcelona and Madrid? And having said this, you did that all from my side. I'll give you the floor for closing this session. Thank you, thank you very much, Idia, Paola, Paula. Thank you very much. Well, closing the session after your contribution, it's kind of a very tricky and difficult thing because we appear, we listen many ideas, intertwined ideas. At the end of the day, we talk a lot about including all the uh, forgotten perspectives when we talk about technology from a technical perspective. But before talking about the ideas before these uh, closing remarks, 
I'd like to ask all those uh, following through YouTube, please write down uh, and the answer to this question. What are the home uh, take messages? What made you uh, carry on working and researching and investigating? I want you to know, right? If uh, you uh, listened uh, and you get new ideas after listening to the speakers. We began this morning uh, talking from our right that we initiated a process in order to define and to reach a minimum consensus about what we understand by democratizing AI. It's kind of a tricky word, the word democratizing. At a first glance, the concept could be seen as the access to the knowledge, access to tools, access to use, accessibility towards uh, projects and auditing technology. In conclusion, we are all talking about getting involved in this decision-making process and to be part of this decision-making process. All along the democratization panel, we repeatedly witnessed the idea of a new generation, boys and girls living in contexts that are hyper-digitalized and the responsibility that uh, our tutors or parents of minor uh, boys and girls, what would be the critical perspective beyond helping them to use any kind of device, computers or consoles? I guess that one of the troubles that we can see repeatedly once we get closer, it is the same that we can see in social organizations. The fear to this technology and uh, facing with the technology things. When I was younger, well, you had to put the VH tape and now you have to control the uh, parental uh, devices and items in uh, our cell phones. Second round table, how to hack from civil society, how to get rid of fear through artificial intelligence, because uh, at the end of the day, we as social organizations, we have this expertise, we have the experience in order to protect human rights and to fight for human rights and not to allow to human rights to be vulnerable. We have a lot of knowledge and know-how when dealing with the techniques and we are able to identify what would be the problem that we have when uh, violating these rights. The clearest example to me, it's the one that Tito said from the taxis, and he said how taxi how cab drivers were able to organize themselves to stop the Uber appearance uh, in some cities. And he also talked about the difficulties that they encounter to make this possible. How we cannot only need to fight against these hegemonic technologies, uh, people that not only know about legislation, but also people that know about technique. This necessary alliance between the techie people. We constantly talked about the need to be more international, to look around us and to create global alliances. Because at the end of the day, we are facing global challenges. As uh, Paola said many, many times, there is a strong relationship with the climate change that we are facing. We also said that the public administration is very slow. We do agree among us. And that's why we are organizing this seminar. We want the administration to know that technology goes very fast but we want to chase this technology. We can help them to create new legislation and to have uh, control mechanisms to avoid the abuses coming from the big techs. 
Yusef also talked about everything that has to do with digital borders, uh, smart borders. I think that borders are not intelligence and also how the automatization reinforces the racial uh, perspective, racist perspective of the European Union. And it really echoes with uh, Paola's intervention. First of all, we should decolonize uh, human rights the way that the Human Rights Charter was produced and what is outside this Human Rights Charter. It could be a great exercise to make, but it's not now, don't worry. We also talk for a while about the new legislation, the European Union, what is preparing for the AI, and some of the uh, things that uh, Yusuf commented was that it exists like uh, hierarchy through nationalities inside the legislation because we prioritize uh, uh, people from European origins and uh, we consider that there are some mechanisms of uh, biometric data at the border that will get uh, classified relying on the legislation that will be proposed as a high risk, but mainly to non-European uh, people's origins. And uh, we can see how the AI development is being used to keep this structural racism, which is the, maybe the base of uh, the European continent security. We also talked about the importance of uh, funds. We need to know where the money comes from, right? Follow the money, where the money comes from. We create these kind of infrastructures, but also when we need to rethink alternatives, when we think alternatives and we face these kind of alternatives, such as the open source software, we need to create uh, some infrastructures that not always can be kept. It's something they did very well, the big uh, tech corporations to permeate all the layers of society was to offer free services without having to pay anything and offering uh, very happily our rights, our digital rights. Simona said something that it was very important to me and very clear to me, the uh, digital are very clear to me and we built all this era in such a manner that we have new cosmovisions that Paola and Paola mentioned before, a new way to create technology that belong to some ideals and belong to some world visions that are not probably the vision that uh, belong to the communities that we represent here. We talked about the obligation of institutions to use public codes to look for auditing technologies. We also talk about the need to keep this fear of technology out. We did it. What uh, we recommended, it is that we need to fight to win the big platforms and also with all the examples that Paola and Paola offered to us, there are some choices to build different perspectives. And we realize that at least, uh, from my humble opinion, I can see that there is some margin and we can uh, reappropriate these technologies and to make them different. I love the concept of uh, deconstructing technology. I won't use any more the word programmers. We need people able to construct, to build, to visualize, to be the builders of technology, to find new digital solutions in a different manner, not only from a technical perspective. This active participation you were talking about, it's important to me. I was also so uh, surprised by the idea of a privacy from a different perspective the concept of privacy. Whenever we talk about privacy, I always think about Carissa Belli, the privacy is a collective uh, right, not an individual right. But I was thought about it 
from the perspective that everything that I expose, it exposes other people's rights. So sometimes a device it's used by other people. And who are we talking about? What kind of privacy are we talking about? It was very interesting as an idea. And to conclude, I think that there are some hegemonic technologies that impose a ways to be react, how we can be uh, proactive towards technology and how a social and civil organization will be able to introduce other concepts to, and we can change these narrative uh, frameworks. We need to change them. The base of digitalization and automatization of a reality, introducing new uh, anti-racist perspective and decolonization and uh, other tools without uh, stopping our imagination, thinking about new tools, thinking about care, about responsibility, and all these uh, systematization behind the curtains. Technology is not something isolated in the society. So, in order to conclude, let's continue, let's carry on, let's rethink, we will have the opportunity to think new uh, futures. This afternoon with uh, at the workshop, the workshop won't be open, so for everybody, those that uh, registered, they have um, an email and a registry number, please, you can write again. And if you want, you have the link at the, in our chat. And if you want to have new opportunity, you, want, you can also write us. Maybe there are some spots free. So the workshop is other uh, future for data. We will rethink the relationship that we have with the AI and the practice of design and justice. And it's going to be uh, made by Platonic. I hope that those that uh, are in the registered in the workshop, I wait all of you. And that's all from my side. Thank you so much. I'm going to read all your comments. Thank you. Have a good evening. Big hugs.